Some sanguine like dividing one into four. If one were to divide the second demon crown into four, we would currently be beginning the transition from one to two. Enjoy. This next story begins after the constant left Moral Farms. He is currently journeying north through the stone lands of Paleo Jersey. For some reason. Otto V. Fox to give at least one word. Planet Sanguine has a circumference of roughly 11 of an 1, 11 miles. The distance from Il Focolare of the inverse continent to the collection of glebes known as the Urine Babel is roughly the distance from New York City to Houston, Texas. Literally nothing is to scale. Put that measuring stick away, Ashoka is the only ruler you need. There are none who know the population of the inverse continent. District 1, relative to 0. Starting off on an empty planet, Ashoka found himself hearing and responding to voices he hadn't in quite some time. Perhaps in response, perhaps out of coincidence, perhaps both. He has noticed, after dying four times, that the idea of the relationship between one and zero is trying really hard to become one of his lords. And of course, that being around others is good for the soul. The Demon King. That's the idea of one wasn't really focusing on the second demon crown, that's the idea that reality is an illusion. So, the Demon Crown. That reality alludes to went around and did some exploring. There wasn't much, but he wanted to see where the urine babble was coming from. Since we're going to be widening our focus from this point on, it'll be good to get some history out of the way. It seems clear that if one thing exists, it will always be possible to define everything that is not that one. Therefore, one always exists with an other. One implies two. It should be rather apparent that the epic of one will involve more than two countries interacting at the same time. Multi when a character speaks a word in a language other than English, that word will be translated in the following format. If translating the word on, which is pronounced onu and means one in Malayalam, it might look something like this. Example sentence irrelevant to the plot. Though Vikram terrified him, Neil Turner couldn't stop himself from blurting out, Okay, but is on in Malayalam. Onu. One, right here, right now? Example sentence irrelevant to the plot. Following the structure, word language, choice pronunciation, translation. Hello. Tony Blacksmith from the future here. I abandon this. Pretty soon. Go back to speed reading. Topped. It would seem that things tend to grow with time and interaction. These two symbols represent translation. And remember, if you abide by rules, you're a loser and deserve to change. Uh, all sanguine are activated. All sanguine are omnilingual. All sanguine have vague, imprecise memories of what has already been done, likely due to coming from one. The sanguine have already learned where their South Pole stands, coincidentally on the same continent on which their species originated. The sanguine call this southernmost continent the inverse continent. The central portion of this continent, where the actual southern pole of the planet is, has been taken over by what is known as the inversion jungle. Yes, that very same jungle where one lost his arm and built a piano and named some animals. And died for the first time. It's grown since. A lot. Like, you remember how quickly sanguine plants grow, right? The inversion jungle is mostly uninhabitable. Unfortunately, like most of this world planet sanguine, with the entire central region being overtaken by the jungle, that leaves two possible lands on this continent for sanguine to live. Unfortunately, because the inversion jungle contains the South Pole, both these countries are north, both these countries are west and east. In response to this dilemma, we are going to cheat. Make up some sounds, and we're going to use them. The side of the inverse continent where one is not is known as the Occident. The side of the inverse continent containing chaos directed and il focolare, bordering Paleo Jersey, has yet to be named. This next story takes place among a large group of sanguine living within this country. Though their settlements are far from close, the sanguine we are about to follow are the countrymen of Il Focolare and Chaos Directed, though as of now, this side of the inverse continent knows no nations. What it does know is justice. Basically, there are a lot of good guys that have been trying really, really hard to stop the bad guys. The borders of the inverse continent and this country have both been drawn by habitability. And habitability is not constant. Some are better than others. This keeps the western border of this soon-to-be country, shared by the rampaging body of water known as the Ultraviolet Sea, and the harsh, lawless, brutal, dream-swallowing marshes that surround the inverse Occident, an entire western shoreline of the ultraviolet sea. These marshes will, too, slowly become one of the primary places of perception on this planet called Sanguine, becoming so familiar with failure and the robbery of life that blood and putrid purple fat have literally flooded the Sanguine and become one with the flora and fauna, smell and texture. Outposts and campsites destroyed by time or other Sanguine litter the marshes of Riaveria, the land of blood and sin. Home to those who tell themselves they just and must survive any way they know how. It is commonly argued among the sanguine, which harbors more hardened carnage, Riaveria, the bloody marsh continent, or the ultraviolet sea. While the population of Riaveria is far greater, most of that difference can be attested to coastal tribes and bandit brigades that only live on the inverse borders. The ultraviolet sea draws some type of reverse evolution, demonic rotation, a more severe forced natural selection, where the already sentient hear voices and demands from their future selves who've seen lands beyond singing songs of the feasts that will be supped by those who can surpass this challenge.
Siddharth Ashoka Kumar, the main character of this book, has been telling stories about pirates in Paleo Jersey. He may not have realized how believable certain types of tales are to people like the Sanguine. Whoops. To the east of this country is an ocean. They call it the ocean. Eight Sanguine years from now, they're still going to call it the ocean. Because aside from the ultraviolet and the thousand slash, that continent-sized body of water to this country's east is the only real ocean. Dry planet. A little cold. Some Sanguine claim the ultraviolet to be the birthplace of the void. They claim the ocean to be the birthplace of God. Sanguine is small, low volume distance, distance, distance. Circumference less than half of Earth's. At this point in time, year one week, two days, seven, 17 sanguine days since Sid's fourth death of the Constance calendar, the planet was still too young to truly understand history. Its lands had now known population, but those citizens knew not what it meant to truly be a nation. Quetzalcoatl was still chilling around, very aware that something was going on, waiting for the information waves to crash. South Hemisphere, but he's not anywhere near the inverse continent. Quetzalcoatl has been on planet Sanguine for millennia. It's a long story. It has to do with the one who built the temple known as the Cone of Dios Pitar. A messy ancient war. The war we are about to follow is not ancient, though it is messy. The war we are about to follow will involve over hundreds of thousands of times as many souls as the war in which the soul who had multiple planets in Earth's solar system named after him banished Quetzalcoatl to the Red Aegis. Sound dissipates, as does focus. Because you know what happens to the laws of physics over time? Our sheer nothing. The representative of House Vav Hebrew, Vav, Hook, brother-in-law of the daughter of the current matriarch of House Vav Hebrew is right to left. Word Krog responded when asked if he had any idea what House Re could bring to the overall metaphorical, but in this case, a slightly literal table by Kisar Shud Hindi. Shudda, pure, a direct descendant of the first sanguine to store in shared standardized units of clean water. The Vav leader has a daughter who has a non-Vav half-brother who has a wife who has a brother who is Word Krog. You get it, it's not that hard. Kisar's parents' parents share a generation with the Shud founder, making him the older one by quite a few skies. Eventually on this planet, due to lifespans and other factors, the English word for grandparent will be replaced with the word deparent, while the title great-grandparent will be replaced with triparent. Likewise, a sanguine's great-great-great-great-great-grandmother will be known as that sanguine's hept mother, and at least one of their hepterant's children would of course be their hex-parent. This goes all the way to Deca, in which the cycle just repeats. Twelve generations back would be your Deca parents' deparents, 35 generations of men would trace a sanguine's decafather's 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 quinfather. Basic idea spell. My father's mother is my die mother. My die mother's father is my tri father. My tri father's mother is my quad mother. My quad mother's father is my quinfather. My quinfather's mother is my hex mother. My hex mother's father is my hept father. My hept father's mother is my oct mother. My oct mother's father is my non father. My non father's parents are two of my deca parents. And I'm pretty positive that my deca parents had parents. Aruda and several other sanguine were busy to the brim, planning their next ultraviolet expedition. Kisar was there as a sort of advising commander, though only because Urda went to Kisar for strategic aid. He wanted this to be Asher thing, and Kisar owed him more than enough solids. You can't just riddle your book with spelling errors and call it artistic expression. Some uptight jizrag yelled in not those exact words. Why do you think there even are any res left? Kisar asked omnilingually, switching syntaxes and tonal structures like they were syllables and sounds. Because even the void has to shit. The omnilingual change and flow of change would have for sure intrigued some intruigable. Werde was devout. He rarely discussed his beliefs, but his clothing and jewelry made it clear. That, and considering his family, it might have forced guided some ideas into powers of influence within Werde's focus. House Re is a perfect example. Sometimes they like to toss in a little English to their sanguine, of the difference between bad people and Diatha bad guys. Sanguine language was very transgender. Bad guys, repeating Kizar's English with his own, you talk about bad guys. There are more re on the sea than the inverse you know. House Ray is evil. Werde really didn't like rule breakers, especially when they were the ones who'd established. He was a captain. His ship was called Chomp and his crew numbered over 60. He'd seen evil. He'd even committed a little here and there. Some gotta do what they got to be. But that was just him living life. There was no point to living life in one place. As an omnilingual sanguine, with some, vague understanding and recollection of the existence of the living, Werdy always felt that he owed it to himself to consume his catches as fresh as possible. He also never sleeps, because Sanguine don't sleep. And there was this group of bits in his soul that wanted to make sure that he knew that when it came to Sanguine, he was here early. Perhaps another Sanguine could have dedicated their entire life to nothing and exploring. The Ophidian of the Void knew every prayer he'd ever spelled since he'd crawled out of the Sanguine as an infant. It already had him. But as far as the 100% percentage allocated for devotion to God of him that wanted to find out how many things there were to count, his name was the one that called him to guide. We're not here to deal with House Re, reminded Kisar, the much older man of much purer blood. We're here because the strongest Liguan Chinese, a Liguan, 
Sanguine that any of the sanguine we know about have ever heard of have all decided that it was the duty of the boiled flesh to donate her children to the ultraviolet. It had been long since Werde had been home. The fortress of boiled flesh was where he was born, conceived, raised. Where he had his first kiss, lost his virginity, got in his first fight, got beaten to his first ever unconscious, ever saw his own blood. It was where he saw his first execution, and much earlier, his first public boiling. It was where he learned to understand good and evil and the war. They've been fighting since origin. It was not where Eurydice first learned of the Ophidian of the Void, and the Ophidian of the Creation, and every damned fool that found itself tracing from them their genes. It was his home. He belonged on the open waters, absolutely. It wasn't that he felt that he should have actually been physically located and verifiably positioned within the boiled flesh's walls. It was more. That something was clearly shifting. Something that he wasn't able to see clearly enough. With the increase of population by this portion of the inverse continent came the need for increased defense. For every family of 15, somewhere else, there was a bandit pack of 50. Orphans abandoned either willingly or unknowingly by sanguine parents who'd either failed to properly clean up or just not check up on they fuck spot. Creation took work, effort, love, and soul. The negative space, that creation paints. That was already there, waiting to be given shape. We all remember that every single creation that ever was, is, or will be has an equal yet doubly orthogonal negative. Murder, betrayal, and deception tattered the lands. The harder the sanguine made it to live, the harder sanguine would have to fight to live. And while, yes, that fight was often internal and against the self, there were more than enough sanguine willing to steal the hard work of others to get by. Input-output ratios and all that. It is a just basic observation. People like the idea of a free lunch. Hausvav was the original settler of the western inverse cliffside, and currently the largest family living in the city-sized fortress of boiled flesh. Haus should in this context being number two, not the second to get there, but the second to reach the same status. With the spreading of the idea of the Constance calendar among the growing and mutating legends of the teenaged wonder himself, came spurting rivers of passion. He has still only gotten to third base, technically only second with the sanguine. Being told that it was the first year in the world set something in the soul on fire. Buying a calendar that, created from the hands of the indentured, embodied the passion and work ethic of the creature that supposedly spawned all sanguine. And it unlocked something in the sanguine economy. That and the increasing acts of rebellion in and around chaos directed, despite their previous absolute fucking titanic embarrassment of a coup d'etat, made the nearing week three seem like the perfect time for an establishment of regional desire. Turns out the sanguine get really passionate about religion. Who would have guessed? The idea of a world with divided faith through hands with another similar yet very not idea. Get rid of the bad guys. Due to some projection manipulation, Houses Viav and Should decided on sponsoring and sending some of their own to form a standing, living army, northwest of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, to patrol, manage, and clean up the nearing Riavarian lands and ultraviolet waters. It hadn't worked before, but there were never any serious efforts. Only the good combating the evil. And losing. This was a statement. A strategic, region-wide mission, a call to action. The River Sanguine of the McVuck, too, had to deal with the vying kings of the ultraviolet and had their fair share of loss against evil. They'll lose more before they lose the option itself. When asked to help the good guys with their mission, the River Sanguine denied. They Sanguine of the River McVuck had no desire to cleanse further lands. As long as their home was protected, they were fine keeping things as they were. The good guys have a lot of sex with each other. Cause they're people, what are they gonna do? Sanguine don't sleep and there's like no mindless entertainment yet, they barely even have sports. If you weren't aware, sex is where life comes from. So there are a lot of good guys that help fight the evil guys, claiming to fight for the boiled flesh and her flags, though they've never even seen the place. Crawling out of the Riavarian marshes, either as orphans, accidentals, or delivered soldiers. There are a lot of good guys now. On the 17th day of the first sanguine year, the sky was an apple red so crisp you would have tried taking a bite. The sanguine didn't have the space to discriminate against anything except the evil. And the razor in, the slur issue of Cupid was already growing in popularity. Typically said in English, though, sometimes translated into Spanish or German for reasons. The idea was simple. The sanguine that have those exodermal tumors only get them because of their parents. Kill or destroy the reproductive organs of all issues of Cupid, the Riazoros bearing sanguine subspecies, and there would be no more. The tumors did increase strength and, well, there were rumors about the tumors, about things the issues of Cupid's could do or see, or remember, given the right conditions.
House Rhee used to be the second mightiest force of the boiled flesh. But over-dedicating their forces into inversion blood magic and Riavarian expansion drew them far too thin. Their only survivors, either among the evil themselves, or straggling descendants that were barely still one with the one who chose the name Rhee. Urda Krog and his allies were standing under an awning going over their plans, looking over several maps they'd chartered themselves, in a valley cove type thing, that the sanguine of the boiled flesh used as a shipyard and base for their standing good guy army. Many of these good guys were more ultraviolet than inverse. Okay, if we want this to work, then we have to go now, Urda said, walking out under the shade of the awning into the misty red air of Sanguine's bottom, towards Chomp. Fuck one, love water. Agreed, Kisar responded, following Urda at a slower pace. Quick math problem. If Kisar and Urda are standing in the same place, then Urda starts walking in a direction, and Kisar starts walking in that same direction, but slower. What happens to the distance between the two over time? Urda, Kisar called out, stopping. Declarity hasn't made it this far for nothing. The mission is to drive him and his forces out. If, just don't risk too much. He's not worth it. Over where Sid was, north of Yurda and Kaisar's conversation. The demon that's the idea of the objective list of all times a good guy called an evil not worth it. Started laughing so loud, he barely perceived it. Urda turned back to face Kisar. The massive body of the rising and seeding Chom docked to the ultraviolet coast behind him. He is. If we don't kill him, he'll come back with more. Leave Remk to Clarity, leader of one of the largest groups of evil on the ultraviolet sea, started out as nothing more than a rampaging Riavarian warrior. When discovering the travel paths created by the inverse cliff Sanguine as a child, he began marking territories as N1s but his own, taking anything he liked from those who wouldn't dare. But then came those who would dare. The good guys, in this case, the fortress of boiled flesh. They, the good guys and gals, drove him out of the inverse continent, expanded the borders of what was called the boiled flesh, and the day was won. Then he came back with more, this time doing nothing more than killing off a few dozen species. When we say kill off here, Livremk is actually responsible for multiple extinctions of plants and animals to the north of the boiled flesh, which was a lot harder to combat because they're gone, even Mean Fails was surprised. When Cliff Sanguine began using the valley that the good guys are now using as a base of operations, it was Livremk and his orchestra of pirates that decided it would be this teat that they would treat with filial focus. Kaisar should have responded with the whole point of the campaign this group of good guys was created for, and by the time he does, we'll have taken ten more islands for Le Cher Bouilly, the boiled flesh. Wurda's footsteps transformed in tone as they transferred from the boardwalk to the deck of his ship. His crew was minutes sixty seconds away from finishing preparations and setting sail. He held the hollow glass orb in his hand that would, through the changing temperature inside, give his holding hand information on the surrounding wind flow flow acceleration, not velocity, is what's responsible for that feeling you get when she texts you. Him dying means hundreds more of us get to live. Next time we see each other, I'll be done. Aside from the word done, Yurda said all of that last part in the same language, French which he and other sanguine usually don't do. A sanguine that only speaks one language is kind of like someone with a really deep home regional accent. Because to the sanguine, language is a type of accent. If you speak to someone who has a Texan accent, you don't attempt their accent in your response. You use yours, they use theirs. Maybe they're similar, maybe not. You can both understand each other just fine, mostly. If a sanguine asks a question to a stranger in Dutch, but that stranger isn't really the type of person to use Dutch that much, they might respond with a fusion of Asian and African languages, to which the asking sanguine will understand, assuming there's no other sound waves causing interference. The sanguine are built for constellar collaboration. Anne Chomp began her voyage north. They weren't planning on sailing more than a few hundred miles into the ultraviolet. They would sail past the first few islands where the good guys had set up basic docks and camps, stopping for supplies and updates on intel on the island where his Huerta's sister and her husband were currently raising their family, expanding the borders of the boiled flesh northward. The two of their abilities, when used together, would make it much easier for him to use his. Because of that, Chomp only needed to store a hundredth of the ammunition they normally would, and the moment Louvremp de Clarity made his evil face seen, Chomp and her sailors would remind all that good is an unstoppable force. Uh, nine, which means no. Why did Louvremp de Clarity say no? Well, read the rest of what he says and you'll find out. He spoke this next bit in mostly Portuguese. The structure was off, though, as the evil tended to do. It was as if he studied only the grammatical portions of East Asian languages, then use that on Native American compounds to tie together his Portuguese clauses. A lot of the evil sanguine that served Livremk spoke a lot of Portuguese. Some of them make certain claims sometimes. Livremk finished his sentence. It's everything. We lose the ship and I may as well be dead. How many Liguan sanguine Chinese word for sanguine actually know my face? The ship goes down and the hurry hurry ultraviolet word for inversen see their victory. We can use that, responded one of the sanguine captains who sailed with his will. Her powers let her see which portions of large bodies of water had seen the most blood. Lie low and plan a resurrection attack. No, our enemy is good confidence. 
We outnumber them, but if they get the idea that they've won, then even their foolish expansions will be an infected penis for us to choke down. Regardless, we'd have to sink all our ships and swim to the nearest islands without getting caught by the hurry hurry. They won't be looking for your surrender. The air grew filled with potential murder as Declarity took off his helmet and looked at the sanguine who'd asked that of him. You think I would? No, no, of course not. I'm just saying the way they fight. They aim our destruction, she brought up, using both the yin and the yang in her sanguine soul. There is another option. Declarity offered in English to the evil sanguine who, like him, were all trapped by islands and patrolling good guys in the waters near the inverse. Most of our rear guard would be lost, and we'd just be trading one enemy for another, but if you ask me... Lavremk let himself be seen smiling this time. Two enemies way greater than one. Issue out the commands to your ships, or don't. They'll pick it up sooner than later. We raise anchors now. The nine feng shui propelled warships of Lavremk to Clarity's fleet brought down their sails, switched the levers on their biggest masts, turning on rudimentary mechanical attempts to draw power from the toxic to human LOL gases in Sanguine's atmosphere. They didn't have combustion engines, but what they did have was a little more advanced than practical steam power. The sky had started setting a few hours ago, so each of the ships was completely torched up, making each look like it were wearing a ship-shaped crown of flame and flickering soul. Livremk looked at his VIP Plus package constant calendar, at the 17 colored-in squares of the first year. The seventh square in the second row of his hour-and-minute counting calendar was painted a bright, bold rojo. The square was labeled 70 or 21 mem, indicating the longest day of the second week so far. The next skyrise would see the eighth day of the week. Wait, wait, sorry, am I allowed to ask what in the fuck is happening RN? Asked the first demon crown that perceived the beginning, cutting off the, the second demon crown that reality alludes to. Did you know? Nacht is how you say night in German. Anuit is how you say night in French. Noite is how you say night in Portuguese. Nachi is how you say night in Spanish. Noapti is how you say night in Romanian. Nat is how you say night in Swedish and Norwegian. The celestial demon seraph. That's the idea of eight struck seven with its right fist, while their king and god were too busy to pretend to notice. In Sanguine, the English word night has become somewhat synonymous. With the phrase natural disaster, Y-120, they wouldn't be able to avoid the patrols. Best case, Livremk would only lose two or three ships before getting where he wanted. It was better than facing certain annihilation. Four ships in sight, the moment a conflict begins, the hurry hurry would send out help for reinforcements. Break them. Communication speed and distance are varied as hell on Sanguine. Their broken call, the Ophidian of the Void, guided into Livremk's soul. It, the Ophidian of the Void, gave him actions, visions. Ill delusions of the blood gurgled cries of his enemies after fucking with him. The hurry hurry sanguine of the fortress of boiled flesh wouldn't attack first. Claiming these waters with their patrols was enough of a sign of war. It was likely that more ships were on their way. If a conflict began, there was no way of making it all the way to her territory whatsoever. The void granted Lavremk their opinions. Lavremk knew that no assumption was capable of avoiding Null. The sound barrier breaking explosions clearly caught all off. Of the four hurry hurry ships in sight, two were behind the Falne Prophet flagship of Lavremk's fleet on which he currently stood. One was less than a mile away to their left, tailing them at a speed that was willingly allowing the distance between good and bad to increase steadily over time. Another was about two miles away behind Livremk's fleet to their right, moving opposite the bad guys. It must have been them. The other two ships in sight were heading towards each other, moving orthogonally to the Falny Prophet, painting a hypothetical border the Hurry Hurry had claimed for themselves. Again, they wouldn't attack unless attacked. But once that started, it would end for most of them. Livremk had hoped to charge through the two ships ahead of them, leaving behind a few ships to draw their fire and focus as he took his three strongest ships, the Falny Prophet, the Evan Trinity, and the Sign of the Beast, deeper into ultraviolet waters, drawing out even worse bad guys that would definitely not take his side but still see the good guys as enemies. Still see the good guys. But the Falny Prophet had already started sinking. Another crash made Livremk aware that despite that incessant ringing nearly destroying both his ears, he could still very well receive vibration. His knees commanded his tendons to still themselves. Two shots, he couldn't even see the ship that fired but the one ship that was fleeing. They must have made contact. The entire deck was flooded. One of Livremk's commanders issued an order to two of the ships furthest to the left of the Falne Prophet. The hurry hurry ship that was tailing them hadn't attacked yet, but that first move would have to be theirs. The two ships fired first, engaging combat and departing from the fleet. Still capable of sailing, the Falne Prophet charges forward east and north as the even trinity and the sign of the beast flank off slightly, creating a forward shield to Livremk's right and left, and the three remaining ships to his right take his rear to block any incoming attacks. They're all moving at different rates. Intense change. The two hurry-hurry ships ahead began attacking the Evan Trinity and the Sign of the Beast. In the case of this 2v2, the bad guys have bigger boats. But the good guys have way more friends. The crews of the Evan Trinity and the Sign of the Beast, shaped by Levremk de Clarity and his commanders, fire off sets of sloppy shots aimed to trick the good guys into assuming a state of enraged panic. 
guiding the good guy boats into positions favorable to this meaningless escape. Every ship on these waters knew what was in the direction of Livremk's charge. Only Yurdi had the sight to guess that it wasn't an act of folly. He placed his hand on his sister's right shoulder. Her husband, half-brother of the House Vav Eris, manned the cannon. One more shot and the cannon would need to be replaced. Declarity's rear guard had already been formed. At the speed they were going, they'd make it through the two ships ahead of them. While that definitely wouldn't be good for any sanguine of the boiled flesh, how the fuck would that be good for him? Is he that insane? Yurda asked his sister in a mix of Portuguese, Turkish, and Chinese. Do you really have to ask? She responded. Her grip on the guardrail was tightening. Combining their three soul activations was tiring her out. She'd never make it obvious. It was to Urda. The scope in his hand had told him that his ally's ship to Declarity's left was called Unul Kuritsat, the cleansed one. He ordered his sister, Ajna Sidivav, to aim for one of the ships attacking Unul Kuritsat that had remained behind to draw their fire, the one that was closer to being obliterated. Hey, first demon crown, perceiving the beginning here. What the fuck is happening? Where are we? Livremk's rear guard all fired long distance shots to create enough flying debris. This planet is windier and has lighter gravity to reduce the impact of Yurdi's pseudo nail gun turret attack. The cannon wouldn't be able to handle anymore. Normally with this strategy, they would use a cannon until it was too damaged from sheer stress and heat to use, then use Ajna's husband's leverage ability, along with Weirdi's kinetic snap ability to launch the cannon as a weapon. If they did at this distance, they could probably take down one of the ships that had detached from the bad guy's fleet. But that was obviously what Declarity wanted. As Yurda ordered his sailors to stop getting ready to launch the actual cannon itself, Ajna interrupted. Erdi, we can take one out now, do this and... I just need a few seconds to breathe. Don't waste the shot. Things were happening fast and loud. Her husband, a Kon Vav, had walked up to Werda and Ajna from his cannon mount, his fingers still powdered with gunpowder. She seemed shocked and almost agitated at him leaving his post, but like Werda, a Kon could see Livremk's plan. A Kon asked Urda as one of the ships on the rightmost flank of Livremk's fleet caught fire, and they watched its crew jump to their nearest ally ship. They'd managed to sink one of the patrolling good guy ships, one for one. How worried are we? The cannon had been replaced. Urdi ordered with a Japanese yell to fire a set of normal cannon fire. We're chasing him, Krog said in English. Several hits. Declarity's rear guard was taking holes, including the good guys' ship that was ahead and to the right of Wordy's chomp, and Unal Kurasat, there were the good guys' four ships against Livremk's fleet. But the bad guys were barely fighting back. Something fighting this hard to survive. It forced Urda to guide his killer within. Livremk's ship, which was slowing down on accounts of its damage, had made its way past the patrolling ship into open waters. The only islands in immediate sight that weren't just bumps on the horizon were behind him. Two ships of his fleet were far behind the rest. He'd likely never see any of those sailors again. Several members of one of the rightmost ships named Basil the Great had been killed or drowned, but more than most had hopped onto the Shub Khali Empty Knight, which was protecting the gap between the fleet's right flank and rear guard. The one ship of his left guard, the Even Trinity, was taking heavy fire from Astartia Starte, the one good guy ship they still had to deal with. Luckily for Declarity, he didn't even have to order the two ships in his rear guard to not take the bait and join the fight. They hugged the fleet tight, holding on to ammo and making their forces seem more massive than they were. Six ships still in function. The Felni Prophet would sink soon if they couldn't find a safe place to dock, which was most likely out of the picture. But on this planet, where everyone is activated, where children understand every language and are aware of the demons, where the truth of a population full of soul activation only makes the laws of physics and God stronger through the connective patterns that derive from all things. It's easy to have faith in the unknown. Faster, the void told him. Heavier, don't listen. It argued with itself as it was designed to by creation. B. Several hours had passed since that bastard from the cliff had started this battle with his ship, Chomp. Livremk wanted him dead. He knew how badly Erdekrog wanted him dead, and he found that annoying. Liev scratched his head. But that wasn't what his crew assumed to be the cause of his annoyance as he yelled, guiding his fleet's updated formation, turning their directive more slightly northward, against the current winds, and away from the most violent part of the ultraviolet, where she ruled. Because why in the fuck were the River Sanguine all the way here? In the ultraviolet sea? Unless the good guys had really started deciding that good really fucking meant good, and that they were right. Three ships. River Sanguine craftsmanship, for sure. Boats designed for living. Longhouses converted into roving fishing vessels, meant for cleaning and farming around the shallower and calmer waters of the River McVook. But they were here. Why? It didn't matter. Unless the good guys were somehow far more united than Declarity had imagined. Then it was just a coincidence. The Ophidian of the Void cackled a deep, divine, demonic series of grunts within Livremk Declarity's virtual focus. Heading further north would bring them into Hurry Hurry territory, where the good guy ship that was still attacking his left wing without getting much in return would soon find friends. The River Sanguine were getting closer. 
and suddenly even closer, as they began shifting course west directly to collide with Livrenk's right flank. This time, no one asked why. A new ship had entered the scene, a black flame, a new mark of sentience in the night, on the top of the ship's mast. This wasn't hers, from the southeastern ultraviolet. If it were hers, it would have bore her name on its flag in deep magenta letters. Black flame meant something else. Black flame meant they weren't one of her allies. But it was a sign that she had allowed them to live. The black flaming bad guy ship attacked the Falny prophet. Levramk's stomach felt a force change and change. It made him sick. And nervous. He thought he might die. And he hated that. The Evan Trinity moved ahead of the Falny prophet, which at this point was minutes from lost. As the left flank opened up, allowing Astarte to get Livremk in their sights, Livremk's left rear guard moved ahead to close the gap, giving Werde a clean shot. The sound effect had vibrations. When it was attacking another ship, the damage to Livremk's hearing was less. But still, the way the blast tore apart the air was enough. It told to clarity how strong the Krog was, just a dreg of the power of House Vav. Of the Huri Huri, the ship to Werde's right was in combat with the rest of the rear guard, receiving no attacks. The even trinity was still ahead of the Falmi prophet, within the sights of the ship that had faced Parathanetta and lived to tell. The sign of the beast was the sole right wing, not firing but getting ready to brace for the brunt of an attack if the river Sanguine actually decided to enter this conflict, which they hadn't. Yet, as the one ship in the fleet's left wing began its digestion of void, Declarity turns his 35-kilogram meter-squared ship Northmore, further from where he wants to be, giving any Sanguine that still breathe on the sinking ship a chance to join his slower drowning boat. Dozens made it. The fleet bellows northeast. Five left. Three of the Cliff Sanguine ships are about to regroup to the northwest of Livremk's fleet. His rear guard in tatters. He doesn't even give them a chance to jump ship to his. They're all dying here anyway. No, it ordered him. Forward. I know. You don't. You're nothing. I'm everything. The Black Flaming Bad Guy ship attacks the Even Trinity. The Even Trinity does everything it can to direct it away from the Falny Prophet. Its sails have taken too much damage to accurately guide. The sign of the beast fires several weak shots at the black flaming bad guy ship against a flying cannon, courtesy of Chomp, bashes into the mast of the Falny Prophet faster than the speed of sound. It cracks and begins to timber. The ship is now stuck at the whims of chaos. Another flying cannon pokes a much larger than cannon-sized hole in the Falny Prophet's hull. Sanguine had already started falling over. The smell of gunpowder blood and adrenaline aren't enough to drown out the yells of life and death. A lookout that managed to survive his fall screamed, begging for death. The sound of a tilting ship in angry divine waters croaks a lot more than you're fucked. The Skyfather was upset. A rogue wave crashed, knocking the entire crew of the Falmy Prophet overboard, capsizing the boat, killing most. Those that weren't killed by the immediate shock of cold and pressure would quickly drown as their panicking bodies attempted doing what God programmed their bodies to do in order to survive. Including Livremk. His head bashed against a rail of his ship, and as his body flew through the rose-misting water overboard, he lost consciousness. Under the water, the blood mixes with hydrogen and nitrogen and uranium and all the copious amounts of iron in the ocean that the sanguine have been calling the ultraviolet as his lungs become incapable of taking in air. And his heart stops beating, and his brain stops thinking. On the 18th day of the first sanguine year at Y-128, Livremk de Clarity was killed by Uer de Krog and his allies. Uer de does not know what Livremk's ability is. Livremk has forgotten how many times he has died. A sole survivor. If anyone has died within 100-100 Mia or meter hours of Livremk de Clarity's death, then his body will revive, giving him a new soul that combines the soul he had when he died with all souls that died within that temporal radius. Livremk named this ability Soul Survivor, after a girl he met as a child. You can guess how Livremk learned about his ability. His eyes are open, his lungs are screaming. These waters are nothing for him. He translates his position. At this depth, at this time, no one can see him. The Ophidians scream in his focus as he sees the deteriorating Falmy Prophet disassemble, divide, and sink to the depths. He has minutes before he needs a breath. Livramka moves. Erda brings his left first down, colliding with Ajna's right fist that she launched up. The two then side stepped into each other, tackling shoulders, their little brother-sister handshake that they started doing when their parents taught them how to hunt. There were three ships in Declarity's fleet still floating, but the black-flamed ultraviolent ship seemed to see them as an enemy. No one aboard Chomp wished to find out where they stood with them. Chomp and her allies turn around and sail to the nearest island west. If the Black Flame did chase them down, which was unlikely, they'd handle it with their full force. Declarity was done for. The River Sanguine were here as well, sailing in the same general direction but on a divergent course to Werda's own. Was this some kind of sign? Worst case, the evidence still had to be acknowledged. The good guys were advancing, and the bad guys were getting worse. Chomp arrived on the island. 
The two ships she was escorting, including Astarte, continued on their own way, patrolling their own waters. There were over a dozen ships along the shore. Less than a dozen sanguine actually called this island their home, but at present there were over a hundred that used it to measure the literal position of their selves. Ajna and Akon went back to their family's island using one of the other trading ships. And on the ninth day of the second sanguine week, Kisar Shuda arrived to meet Werde in his ship, bringing all the captured prisoners of Livremk de Clarity's fleet. They were all naked, shackled, skin split open from the brutality of their capture and physical effect of untreated salt water and sun, their faces swollen, their spirits crushed. But a few of them, one in every three or four, Werde could sense it. They weren't dead yet. Their souls, their senses of self, they still clung to de Clarity. Or could that have been? Were they looking further? If de Clarity was their star, were they putting their faith in some deeper truth? Did their ideologies grow that thick? Do the threads flow that strongly? No. These are my enemies, Werde affirmed to his ophidians of creation and void. Irda had spent his time on the island helping stockpile resources, mainly thick-skinned fruits and dry kindling, while building rudimentary shelters and buildings for future stores and supply towers. Now that Kisar was here, it was time for his falling action. He'd mostly not been paying attention to Kisar's words, but his focus spiked as Kisar uttered El Fukumi, the Swahili words for 10,000,000. ,000. Sorry, sounded almost Britannical from Irda Krog of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh. It comes from the top, responded Kisar. Remember that sanguine do not get pregnant. After sexual intercourse between a male and female post-pubescent sanguine, there is a chance that an infant sanguine will crawl out of the ground nearby where the fucking happened. We need 10,000 soldiers before week four. Get breeding. Lord Kisar Shuda of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, House Shuda, and the last of the former bad guys, now slaves, finished exiting the giant ship Kisar had bought for himself three skies prior. Did you know that Zor means difficult in Turkish? I don't know how much you know about momentum and kinetic energy, but infinite velocity. An object with multiple positions moves quick. These guys weren't even bad guys anymore. They were now valued goods, even the ones of them that had enough of a soul to keep the light on in their glare. Property that conveniently understood language and could reproduce with free sanguine, a few hundred calories of food every ten hours, and the focus required to watch the brain dead and will broken was more than worth it for a tool capable of producing potentially dozens of sanguine an hour. Sanguine rape had some galactically shattering implications. Imagine how many people there'd be if pregnancies lasted nine hours instead of nine months. Differences get wild when their objects of focus stretch. The fact that live and love sound and look similar is a coincidence. Unique to English, it doesn't happen anywhere else. Kisar would bring more to help Yurdi on this mission. But it was time to populate. The good guys knew how the bad guys would react to leave Remk's disappearance. They needed troops. Uh, His grip hurt. I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna... Livrenk's internal rage-shuddering stumble was interrupted by his soul's snap, as he looked up and prayed that he, Livrenk's god, was seeing what he was seeing. No, it matters not what I will do. What matters is that it is done. Beta females really, really FKN ruined the word goddess, queen too. I'll take it upon myself to come up with a new cooler, epic spell. You're welcome, women. B. Anyway, Livrenk had just finished murdering all the sanguine on the black-flamed ultraviolet ship. He mostly used his bare hands, but he used some of their weapons. Bro, let me tell you, those things were advancing quick. Liv didn't even know what the name of the ship was. This version of himself, he could tell it didn't really care. The Ophidians felt strong in this new soul. Both of them, they felt radioactively real. The ship was empty. The good guys were smart to leave it behind. That black flame. It meant that Paratha Nada had permitted this vessel's existence. Two enemies are way greater than one. Livremk de Clarity starts sailing east, into her territory. Translating is a tricky thing. Rotation and scale are nice and curved and continuous. Movement crackles. Anyways, the Sanguine speak all human languages, if you'd forgotten. Some Sanguine remember all the words for scientist. Arthur and Sid are kinda dumb fucks, so they didn't bring too many equations which them. Arthur probably figured they'd just derive them. Sid is a tard. Quasar Quattle hasn't been on Earth in millennia, but these guys will figure it out on their own. They're mad quick. And did I mention they're all activated? In the souls, I mean. Second demon crown of one here. Reality is the illusion. Ajna sat with her knees folded watching and listening to the waves crash on the shore under the glimmering peach-tinted horizon. It was the fifth day of the third week. Werda was visiting her, meaning that both of them were away from their families. Ajna only had her two daughters and son, and her husband. Werda was unmarried, but his children. Well, it makes more sense to say that the eastmost force of the boiled flesh was almost entirely built up of Yurdi's growing children and descendants. They already numbered in the thousands. Thinking about it made her soul felt weird. This particular island was the easternmost island in the ultraviolet sea that the boiled flesh had claimed, meaning that this was the closest they were to her territory. Not the safest place in the world by any means, but they'd be fine. Parthenida and her ultraviolence ultraviolence were still reported as being based far further from where the boiled flesh set their sights. 
Their outer islands weren't too well defended, only creating a light outer cloud capable of easily sending information to the more heavily fortified and armed islands claimed by the boiled flesh to the west. It was Ajna's idea, supported heavily by all parties. Had they begun patrolling, supplying, and heavily arming islands closer and deeper into Barathaneda's territory, however, it was more than likely that more than a few dozen sanguine on her side would see a clear invasion of war. Ajna Sidivav stood up and began continued her patrol. Sanguine don't sleep. There were maybe 400 sanguine living on this island. It was large. There was a decent chance enemy spies were here among them. But that was good. Good was far, far more infectious than evil. Hers and the other families of the boiled flesh had planned for all possibilities. They were ironclad. Acon's half-sister, the next in line to lead the boiled flesh, was a natural-born genius like her brother. It took Ajna nearly six hours of walking before her soul sniffed trouble. It was less than an hour later when she found the rowboats. They had been destroyed, but after a quick yet thorough survey, it had been made clear to her that somewhere near a hundred pirates had boarded this island. Recently. How were they planning on leaving? Were they? Ajna saw two paths. Go tell her brother, Yurde, who was somewhere on the island, likely helping secure resources and mentoring the new guard on architectural stability, or put one of her ideas into motion. Here was their origin. Ajna looked into the ultraviolet water, reflecting the orange horizon. She imagined who they were. Who led them? Why they were here. She then turned towards the shattered rubble of their arrival. A smile boarded the island that was her face as she realized she'd be able to find these amateurs easily. The path of their souls. She could almost feel them. They felt young. It didn't take long for her to find them. Or their leader, rather. Werda was helping a sanguine lay stones to border a road from one of the main settlements deeper into one of the island's forests. Ajna asked Werda if he could check something out at the southern coast of the island. When he asked what, she responded that he'd understand once he saw it. As he left, Ajna was left there alone, with the adult male sanguine, several inches taller than her, but definitely more than a week younger. Is this your plan? Become one of the good guys? Ajna asked the sanguine. Sorry, do we know each other? Cut the crap. I saw your boats. There must be a lot of you here. Is this what every one of you is playing at? Ajna interrogated. The look in his eyes darkened slightly, as did the horizon. Nightfall was on its way. Clouds were above as well. Look, I just want to help build this road. The people here need my help. I'm here to help. Ajna reverse nodded. Do your allies feel the same way? If they don't, he asked. A magnetic flame of the very soul forced the young man's gaze to jolt towards the execution in Ajna's pupils. Admit those boats are yours right now, or I'll torture their locations out of you. He almost moved his hand to his right pocket. Yeah, they're ours, but look, I don't give a shit. You want this island? It was simple. Building civilizations was hard. Staffing and supporting satellite islands was difficult. Ajna used her basic knowledge on sanguine greed to give this new bad guy turned good guy a mission. Turn this island into his kingdom. Make it a place where his quad children and quin children would be revered as kings and queens. It was working since Ajna threatened to do unspeakable things to the limbs and joints of his allies if he refused. I won't even tell you what she planned on doing to his family. Because they Ajna and some rando were interrupted. As a bump on the horizon grew with the falling night, Ajna pulled out her spyglass. She looked off in the distance. At that ship that she now realized was fucking gigantic likely homing thousands, and the main flag it sailed. Parat, Neda, Parathanita, has stolen the stage, amongst quadrillions of other creations. Paratha is a rule breaker, born to destroy that has yet to know Tatter. Her sails shrieked her name, and Ajna couldn't even react to the gun being pointed at her face. She dropped the glass as the sanguine man asked, what, since she clearly didn't give a single queef about him. Lehoni konyo, lehoni konyo, the bloody cunt, you're a lucky bastard fuck, Ajna defeated said. Then, looking at the gun pointed in her face, she grabbed the attacking wrist, ducked, brought the gunman to the ground, disarming him while adding his gun to her own arsenal, and used her knee and other leg to keep his body pinned to the ground. No way this is an actual gun, she thought as she examined the technology. How am I lucky? The evil pirate who'd been offered ownership of the island asked in pure English. Lucky and unlucky, you fool. Lucky because you have no idea what it's like to feel this for a second time, and you never will. You're unlucky. Because she's about to take your first. Ajna said to her younger, in mostly Burmese, though occasionally throwing in a little structure of Russian and diction of Italia, I only survived the first time because I'm special and amazing and awesome too. But there's no way I'm getting away more than once. The bigger picture didn't even have time to be mentioned. This was war, but Ajna's chemicals, the Yuki particles that collided in her focus, stopped her from doing anything other than being herself. As the ship grew larger in their sight, a blob of shadow detached and caused a splash in the firmament. The wake of Lahuni Kanyo caused large cresting waves to deter off of the ship. But this was something... Numicom. Rapid. And... Rapist. The dark, shadowy figure was raping the flow of the water. That's what it felt like to everyone and their souls. 
The young man had an idea of who it was. He could see the animal. A adult withers can swim over a hundred miles per hour. Yes, they use miles and meters here. You can blame the deviant Arthur Sui from the future. She'll be here soon, Ajna thought as she fired the gun at nothing. It smelt the air, messed with her hearings ringing. But this is good. She knelt down. There was no way anyone on this island was surviving. But she could use his greed. If you want to be a king, take all the sanguine and food you can and flee to the nearest island. Burn all the food you can't take. Go. Now. As the man left, Ajna was left alone. She couldn't even get herself to believe that praying for the boy would have helped him. Parthaneta, on her fully grown adult male wither, swimming through the ultraviolet waters towards Ajna and the island. It was a synonym of death. It crushed every inch of her perceived probability field. Like carbon becoming that thing with the cuts in the sword, you know. Ajna Sidivav saw her future. She saw God's determinant of her actions. She ran deep into the island. Even if she was dying, she had to destroy as much of their food stores as she could. It's too bad that Ajna's adrenaline was preventing her from assuming Partha's state of mind with clear accuracy. Another tree fell. The enemies actually had very similar goals. Then again, not at all. Paratha had made land. The ultraviolet itself seemed to grow angry at her presence, catching the island up in its attempt to wipe her off the body of God. Her strength. It disgusted. Even though Ajna couldn't see or smell or feel. She could hear the trees fall, smell the sanguine flood, just barely feel the quakes of the pain and agony through the air. Her movement slowed. As the killer entered her field of vision, Fartha's smile caused Ajna to fall to her knees. It felt as if her outer muscles and skin were turning into trumpets being played as loud as limits would permit. Netta must have been nine feet tall. Her axe even taller, its blade absolutely dripping with blood-fat skin and hair, pieces of flesh and muscle still dangling off. There were arrows lodged in Paratha's arms and legs, but it only seemed to add to her breath. Her twitching snarl, a trail of varyingly attached body parts and corpses trailed her wicked path. Ajna looked to the ground and began praying. Which gods do you think I mean this thing is like two earth months old tops and was born a milky way away? It felt as if Partha was in front of her in an instant. As Ajna looked up, she finally cried and spurted out groans of sadness. Because at the same time, Partha asked to the man behind her, Yo, declarity in English, what should we do with her? A mess of incorrectly, incoherently put together slang. Livremk declarity looked at Ajna. Then he looked down at the severed head in his left hand, one arrow sticking out its mouth through the back of his throat, one in his eye, and one in the head's right ear. Livremk did a half-double take and then looked at Ajna, tossed Yerdi's severed head at her, causing her to erupt in sobbing, and turned to the coast of the flaming island while managing an I don't care. Partha used her ability, thrust her axe into the sand deep, causing a tremor that almost felt like a rumble. The axe stood tall like a street lamp. Partha grabbed Ajna's face and forced through her gaze until the two women were making eyes contact. Partha applied Newtons to her fingers. Then a little more, then a little more, causing Ajna to scream and Partha's own arm muscles to tighten and burn. She felt a crack and then she stopped holding back, destroying Ajna's brain. Her corpse fell back. Partha bent over and gleared at the body. Hey, Declarity, want to eat the corpse? She's strong, the Razorin asked while pointing with a smile. Turning her massive alien but basically just red human-looking face towards Levremk's sanguine back, both their hairs were black, smelling like the ocean, and blood OFC. Partha Netta's Razoros covered her right arm from trapezius to wrist. Livremk didn't answer, or maybe he didn't hear. Every one of the hurry hurry on this island were dead by now. Baratha Neta looked around. No one was near. Her smile slowly waned into neutral expression. Her eyelids lowered slightly. Before they moved on to the next, she put her fingers to her chin and rest her elbow on her axe. Her breath reeked. It was warm and stung. She wanted to think. Not sure Chinese, it sure means isn't Chinese. I don't even remember what rules I created for this thing. Here, some point in between now and another point in time that was before now, Livremk de Clarity made his face seen in a cove where Paratha and her forces were based. Livremk's face was a little bloody, but the fact that he looked mostly relative to these fuckers' lifestyle, fine after killing as many of the ultraviolence as he had, was why the Reavers who'd brought him here were so proud in their smiles to bring their prey to the Partha. Shock Partha's first deputy, the guy who can do that thing where he shakes ships and causes big, big toll waves to crash. You remember that I mentioned that when Ajna died, right? She might not have been focusing on it. But Shock over here was sitting on the back of what we, like the Sanguine, are going to be calling an Acceleraptor. Now, yes, if you or me or any other earthling were to see an acceleraptor, we'd be completely robbed of free will, as God himself would take control over our bodies, forcing us to yell, Dinosaur. Because yes, Shock, first deputy of Barthanita, was riding the back of an ostrich-sized dinosaur. But don't freak out, because on this planet, acceleraptors are bred like horses. Everyone uses them. In addition, if I may add, acceleraptors have wings. Two sets of wings. One set that kind of looks like a set of chicken wings. No, wings a chicken would have, feathered and pretty and colorful and all that. They use these to make large bursts of three-dimensional movement. 
Under those large feathered wings are much lighter wings, bee-like, translucent. Wings that vibrate beautiful songs of frequency. Wings that beat fast. So fast frequency is measured by pitch, essentially allowing the Acceloraptors the ability of levitation. Three-dimensional combat. Shock was not the only one there on the back of an Acceloraptor, but his Acceloraptor was the biggest, and it was dripped out in the heaviest metals. Kural, the second deputy, was sitting on the floor. He's the one you should focus on, because... Last time I offered you a place at my side, you went to war with one of my friends. Her voice, I mean, fuck it, it'd do things to you that you wouldn't understand. It'd make you want to research every micrometer of human biology just to be closer to the truth of how life can matter with such inertia. This creature owned reality like it was money. Lee Remk didn't respond at first. Hurry, hurry, that's all he said. He looked around to map the faces to the murmurs the one four-syllable word caused. He felt power. You want a black flame? Then you need to try and kill me. The woman spoke. Livremk thought about kneeling, about putting his head to the ground, but he just kept his eyes collinear with hers and made his voice heard. I, n I want your help. Lots of languages became one. Partha looked down. It grew quiet. Isn't it weird how quiet can grow? She commanded Kural, her second deputy, to kill Declarity. Livremk felt power surge into his right fist as her respect flushed his entire sense of self. Livremk Declarity's soul had never been so strong. You've seen the future. Why would you want to see or even know about their fight? Are you sick or something? You know, Livremk is the one who won. Kural died. Just imagine smelling the blood and anguish. He had a lot of history in his soul. Declarity is strong. And now he's Partha's second deputy. Development can make sense if you're there for the ride. But if you only see the end, then you might feel a little lost. For example, year one, week four, day two, Y142. Officially, Bhartha Netta had killed over 8,000 of the Cliff Sanguine, children of the boiled flesh. She treated all objects as her subjects, forcefully, wrongly. 8391. That was how many were either confirmed or assumed dead. 2227 Sanguine still recovering after surviving one of her or her allies' attacks. 31 missing Sanguine with statistically significant chance of being alive. Even statistics have a higher motive. Like the sun, sanguinity had advanced. The strong have always been strong. So, uh, yeah, I don't even know how to explain this one. Someone's whispering the deviant in your ear, but you can't hear them. Why would a giant female sanguine draped in the finest, most exuberant, eccentric, flamboyant feathers, silks and braids, be wearing a poorly made fake mustache with a set of way too big even for her giant sanguine head, glowing neon glassless glasses, setting off a set of colorful fireworks, yes, gunpowder, by one of the main drawbridges around the moat of River McVuck? where one of the largest sanguine settlements had remained strong for sanguine weeks and weeks? It's a really, really long story. Imagine a three-leaf clover. The bottom of the stem is the sanguine south pole. The stem is inversia and the jungle. The left clover leaf is the boiled flesh, cliff sanguine. The middle clover is il focolare and moral farms. The right leaf is the cathedral of failed hail. The little cusp between the left and middle leaf, that would be the river Macvuk. They're just known as the river sanguine. Those river sanguine just call their home home, wouldn't you? Sometimes they call it Haim or Yem. This specific sanguine has a fun ability. His ability allows him to perceive how recently another person received the information that they convey when they speak. For a hotel owner that doubles as an information broker, it's a useful ability. Or maybe his ability was what made him choose this life. He was born with it. On the 33rd day, Y1, 43 of the first sanguine calendar, created by the legendary roving boy god called the Constant by the Sanguine, this specific sanguine business owner, who we'll call Jigda, since that's what his parents named him, is enjoying his portion of life spreading and mutating the different tales he's heard his customers tell about the constant and their other gods. Spinning in some of his own ideas, fun fantasies, and evil idiosyncrasies, Jikta enjoys applying his higher dimensional pressure onto the inverse continent's population's view on what was worth focusing on. The walls were wood, as were the counters, tables, and chairs. Some portions of the floor had this bioluminescent blue moss where Sanguine could wipe the dirt and mud off their feet protectors before dining in the lobby or checking into their paid rooms that were available at Jigda's hotel, which he owns. Because Jigda owns a hotel in Sanguine Year One, Siddharth Ashoka Kumar dropped out of high school less than a an earth year ago. You know what would have drove Sid Ashoka Kumar mad? Because in this hotel type thing, on the first floor, in the lobby, not any of the private rooms, but in the main lobby of the hotel, where you could see the cooks in the kitchen cower down in fear at their head chef's grandmother fucking aura, all the sanguine in the area were singing a song. There were less than 50 of them. But the branch on the tree, they were actually singing in this weird blend of Italian and German, even though this wasn't like an established song or experience or anything. And the tree in the hole and the hole in the bog in the... Sanguine memory was just weird. Maybe someday some scientists will figure it all out. The scientists on this part of the planet had already figured out alcohol. I want to see this planet curve and bend, thought Jigda. He knew about the curve of this planet. 
sanguine kind of knew things. Jigdo was born after 2017 AD. It hadn't been more than 356 days. But his brain. An adult human would have found themselves at a loss at any debate they would have challenged him to. There are objective probability fields. He shouldn't be able to do that. Jigda's head is over six feet above the soles of his feet. Jigda does what he wants. And he was a little horny. It had been days since he'd been alone in a room with nothing but a woman. Off the bat, he'd spotted three women in his lobby that were his type. His new head chef, obviously, but she was necessary to his operations, and he wouldn't mind taking that ship slow and steady. There was his receptionist, one of the employees that had been with him the longest. Physically, she was the most Jigda's type. But fucking the receptionist was just too obvious. Jagda craves exotic spice. Jigda began thinking to himself about the new regular at the bar, drinking alone, who he was pretty sure had mentioned to him skies prior that she was a saleswoman of some sort. Fabrics or bracelets. Something tacky. I remember thinking that she worked with cheap tacky resources. Sent one of Jigda's internal ophidians. He was too entranced by his current moment to worry about which one. She was hard to read. Purposefully, Jigda assumed that there was a certain fragility to the way her confidence held her chin up, as if she wanted someone to tell her that it was all right to be the way that she was. Jigda walked forward as he imagined the Ophidian of creation slowly pointing a thumb towards Jigda's heart and thought, I'll be him. He was stopped by another woman he knew, a woman he was trying pretty decently to forget. He'd never forget her name, though. Her voice was mildly annoying. It made him want to listen. She was being so chipper that everyone in the lobby must have shifted their focus to her and Jigda, at least for a moment or two. Jigda wanted to glance over at the saleswoman to see if she had reacted, but was drawn in by his head chef's laugh and couldn't stop himself from open mouth grinning, craning his neck around the eye contact of the shorter woman who was trying to mark her territory loudly, and asking, what do you got that's letting you laugh that tough? To her, Jigda of the River McVuck's new head chef. Throttle exhale was barely born at the time, yet internally she spoke in order to listen, and she heard a voice say, please settle children, save your questions. For the end, the Sanguine are going to start fighting soon. Message delivered with angelic forewarning. In this room lie Sanguine. Whenever someone asks Jigda a question, he can hear in his head the voices of everyone in the room, giving what they would answer to the asked question. The clarity of the voices in Jigda's mind depend on the person in the room's ability to lie. If there are four people in a room, North, East, West, and Jigda, and East is a really good liar while West is a terrible liar, and North asks Jigda a question, Jigda will hear five voices in his head. He hears his voice and another one in his head clear as his own. Then he would hear East's most likely response to the question extremely clearly, as if they said it aloud. West's answer would still be heard, but it would sound like he said it while a fighter jet was flying less than a thousand feet over. In this room lies Sanguine. Jigda suddenly started crying and shouting before he heard the voices. He had no idea why. Until the boy demon king called the constant by the Sanguine roared in his head, Jigda, get out of there now! He had been crippled by shock. His staggered sense of self couldn't allow him to properly decide what to do next. What the fuck is happening? Jigda was failing to think. The idea of a cheering crowd was actually making a lot of really good points within Kisar Shuda's perception. He looked up. A large flock of birds, too many, not hunters, messengers. Far more than half had parchments tied around their feet. Different types, different colors and sizes. Fuck is it now? Kisar's immediate assumption was that Parthanita had just bombarded him with a series of taunts, which his Ophidian of the Void, at least, was starting to get a little anti-anxious about. He was tired. So he gave his Ophidians very little thought. There were thousands in front of him yelling and striking dummies and cold bottom of the planet air in practiced unison. Expanding into the ultraviolet had been a complete and massive failure. At this point, the fourth week of the first year, Y1.4x. The boiled flesh had even given up on trying to calculate just how much they'd lost. Nanvav, the next leader of the boiled flesh and one of the most influential sanguine on the continent, was the woman who'd campaigned the idea that through their previous conflicts, the boiled flesh had learned more than enough about Parathanata's tactics to set up a perfect counter-defense, and was currently busy fortifying said defenses. She was still technically within the safety of the fortress she calls home her birthplace, but as close to the fort's edge as she could get. Her desires crawled similar to Kisar's in that regard. Once she knew where she needed to be, her life became about getting there. Kisar knew that Nan wasn't defending him, which is why it almost irritated him how she didn't even make fun of him for how gracefully she'd saved his ass. Morale compounds like a raging Neptune. The soldiers Kisar was currently training were stronger. Their armor and weapons were better, and with the influx of Paratha's troops in their western waters, these children and teenagers would grow into adults with a hatred for criminals who'd even acknowledge the easy approach. The problem was education. These soldiers of the cliff, when compared to the previous attempted pioneers of the ultraviolet, were dumbasses. If the word retarded means slow in thought and agency, then the current generation, Y14X, of soldiers of the boiled flesh were retards. Kisar overheard their conversations all the time. 
It did less than feed his hope. But there were others who'd worry about that. Leave the politics to him, Kizar's Ophidian sent. I want to be a man of war. His eyes danced cautiously as he read the third message. And the ninth. And when the seventeenth advisor gave him the exact same clumsy mess of terror that was the aftermath of Parthenita. Every single message being sent to the Fortress of Boiled Flesh was the same, despite their differences. The river has been attacked. Parthenita has infiltrated the River McVock. The location of the bloody cunt, her flagship, is unknown. The River McVock has been attacked. This map of the inverse continent is just something that Arthur Suey, the archangel that guides guards and links one history, drew on the floor of his room. He's from the future, so he's got bigger things to worry about. But Parthenita, Nan Vav, and the Holy Prince of the Cathedral of Failed Hale do interest him. Kisar is in debt to the Deviant, Beto. Based on everything Kisar had received over the last several hours, she was still there. Right now, it's getting a little crazy in here. He couldn't help himself from mumbling. The soldiers were used to Kisar when he was shifted into gear. Kisar wrote down a few more hours worth of exercises for the senior students and left to go meet with his father, Lord Commander Nishvor Shuda, Holy Commander of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh's Armed Forces, Supreme Admiral of its Navy. Nish Fershuda was the strongest voice against Kisar's increasing debts to the Deviant and Chaos Directed. This war brought Nan to his side. They needed the weapons. Arthur Sui was a human from planet Earth, just like Siddhartha Ashoka Kumar, the Constant. They were elsewhere. I have my own problems to deal with right now, thought Kisar. Kisar then thought about the one called Quetzalcoatl, and how those who'd been to Chaos Directed or claimed to know Sanguine from the city seemed certain that, like the Constant and the Deviant, the Quetzalcoatl was a human from Earth. Um, until Partha is dead, protecting the boiled flesh from the ultraviolet is my goal. Irda, I will avenge you. I promise. His dragons flew in a way that reminded Kisar of his younger skies. The moment the door closed, Kisar perceived all the air in the room grow cold. It was just him and his father. He had the look in his eyes that he got whenever coming back from a meeting with Nan's mother. The boiled flesh's leader. Nish Shuda took the glass on his desk in his hand and laughed as the cold spread to his fingertips. This feeling was new. Kisar, deep in his inner focus, allowed his ophidians of creation and the void to spawn a new demon, currently unnamed. Kisar is not the type to change, but the war that was consuming his country did more than enough to activate his soul. Pure viles. Kisar can transfer liquids. If he's holding an empty cup, he can teleport liquids from other nearby containers into the one he's holding. Kisar is strong. Blood is mostly water. All sanguine can resist anything. And everything is a container. Over elsewhere from the fortress of boiled flesh and her going-ons, blazes were burning. Get filtered. But sorry, the ruler of the river McVuck's Ophidian of the Void slipped out. Several members of his hunting party had either fallen too far back, vomited themselves into a fit of epileptic shock, or straight up committed suicide when they saw how serious he'd gotten. When they'd realized that in this specific instance, in this case, in that direction where Jigda's hotel is, was, smoke means fire. Let's get a fire going, smoke all these bugs out, said the river's ruler. The ruler flew his acceleraptor as fast as he possibly could, and when he'd pushed it too far, he thanked it by kissing the back of its neck gave it a job well done by jumping off like a Mario with his Yoshi, and swapped Acceleraptors with his current eighth in command. Even pushing as fast as they were, it would still take over five minutes to get where he needed to be. Everyone by their ruler's side understood. Despite all the smoldering carnage beneath their flying fleet, their ruler needed to see inside his longhouse, where all his stuff was, where his children ate, where they would never eat again if... They the River McVuck's ruler's party flew, the ruler's longhouse was usually sounded and surrounded by the hustle and bustle of thousands. It was now a contorted screeching rose. He and his party entered his home. I am gonna fucking kill wa. Bharathanita Bharathanita is soul activation. The you is very, very plural. But first she's gonna talk about it. But first she's gonna- Bharathanita was sitting entirely naked aside from the flame light and skin and skull of a murdered demon, which as her cloak left essentially nothing to imagination. It smelled like blood and hardened dry shit. Everyone else in the room was a corpse. There was the ruler of the river McVuck lying prone, bleeding out from the knees and paralyzed by the tongue and spine. And Parathanetta, two living, breathing souls. Her cunt lips weren't as haired as you'd expect. It was dripping puddles on the floor. Pussy fluid smells pretty alluring to some. She sat still, no expression on her face, leaning back, but only literally. Eye contact with the lame so dense it grabbed even light. It wasn't enough to be called a spray, but the minor stream of fertilizable fluid twitching out of Partha's cunt started pulsing with an increase of frequency. The page is and has been tainted by waving lines of blue and red. Ultraviolet claims of error mark my every choice. It was a near universally held belief on planet Sanguine that those who spoke only in English or even with full English sentences were deeply religious. My Sanguine have the option to be wrong, she said in American, her soul raging with the voice of a genocider. 
but earnestly speaking with the timber and tone of a librarian telling a tale to a troop of autistic children. It was like seeing someone holding a black hole in their hand as a toy. The fire crackled. The ruler had no words. It was not his proximity with death nor his paralyzing fear. He knew it was Barthanetta in front of him. His ears and mind perceived every word, but he had no clue what she was talking about, much less how to react. What? Why did I say that? thought Partha as she slowly stood out of the leather fish flesh cushioned chair and walked over to the soon to be corpse. She knelt over and thought, I meant to say the right to be strong, and then perceived his perception and said, In the coldest professional sounding business speak you've ever learned about, sir, sir, oh, the problem is worse than I intealized. Partha bent down, baking eye contact with the prone lane lame. Oddly enough, it was the first time the chief had ever noticed how sexy her voice was. When Bart Nato whisper spoke, I am going to have to start getting aggressive. And then we see her attacking multiple other collections of sanguine bandit gangs, very violently and with such realism and tactful higher dimensional leadership that you think, wow, Tony Blacksmith, this isn't needlessly violent at all. This is just an accurate depiction of how ideologies collide. And it's engaging. Wow, this is so much better than One Piece, to which I would say that's absurd, get out of my head. The narrator then states that it is good that the reader has no idea where these battles are taking place, because that will be very relevant to what comes next. Rising action takes time and interaction, even for grown-ups. Here's an experiment. If a genie offered you an infinite amount of wishes, how many would you make before taking a break? To think about it, or for others. Everyone who's on Earth right now, I've been told it's about eight billions, has an objective set of answers they give. Maybe the Sanguine do as well. It was the first day of the fifth week. Sanguine Y1.51, immediately following Y1 to 40 because zero comes after nine. The torrents of smoke and flame from the river McVuck were visible, and infiltrating the nostrils of many within the fortress of boiled flesh. They, the fortress of boiled flesh, were still looking for Parthenita south of the river McVook. The overwhelming majority, 50% of survivors from her assault on the river McVook, sought refuge northeast, either in the stone lands of Paleo Jersey or within Il Focolare's territory, as far from Parthenita's terror as they could. The very bravest among her victims would loudly proclaim that they would emigrate to the deviant led city. Chaos directed, but information from Chaos directed hardly left its borders. So it was hard to say if Parthenetta was working with the Deviant. Kisar did not want that. Every single soldier from the Fortress of Boiled Flesh used a weapon or wore some piece of armor that contained the Deviant's detached cells. Not only was the interest in the debt Kisar had brought on House Shuda growing, but the blades pointed from all sides towards his forces were tightening along every axis. It was on this day, Y151, where Kisar became reacquainted with an old acquaintance of his, a wild sanguine by the name of Klon Ri. The reunion occurred as the sky above faded from dark black into minty green. Slowly, and the overwhelming majority of Kizar's Acceleraptor riding soldiers took the change in bright as an opportunity to descend and find safe land to snag a lil repose. Kizar allowed his Acceleraptor to descend slightly, but only to relocate his velocity vector to a space with less resistance, and so that he could still overhear the chatter of his subordinates. When the number of visible Acceleraptor riders dwindled to the dozens, including Kizar Shuda and Nanvav, they both heard a familiar voice yell out from above, standing atop an Acceleraptor that had no armor, no saddle, but only a helmet, and a barbarian by the name of Klon Ra standing on its back yelling, they not gonna find a spot to land anyway. I smart. A fight ensued. It was not bloody. It was loud. Nan made it clear to every witness that the fight would be contained to her Kizar and Klon. The fight lasted less than an hour. They were several thousand feet above sea level. Not too much blood was lost. Nan and Kizar used their soul activations here and there. Klon didn't. The fight ended quickly as Kisar exclaimed that Urde's dead, and Klon told him that he already knew. Klon also told Kisar not to worry, because his mercenaries down below would be smart enough not to attack lethally any soldiers that were wearing boiled flesh armor. Klon was a violent soul, but compared to Parthenetta, he was a chihuahua. When Kisar offered Urde's postion rear admiral to Klon, he spurted out a whoa dude, holy shit wasn't your dad lord holy commander Neish for shoot a fucking a hundred when he got that. In a British sentence so enraging that it got Kisar to, in Telugu, respond with a, how is that even something you know? Dejectedly. Ultraviolet pirates were everywhere, swarming the grounds of the inverse continent. Barathanetta and her known associates were nowhere to be found. By the end of the 41st day of the first sanguine year, Kisar felt he finally had to ask, because the voice was only getting louder. <laughs> non, nervously and almost jovially inquired Kisar, perched atop his fast flying acceleraptor. That's Lady Commander to you, Shuda, grumbled one of Nan's veteran retainers. Don Vav, sorry. Lady Commander Nanvav of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh was deciding not to answer Kisar Shuda. Kisar noticed. She noticed, he noticed. Dude, added Kisar in English. Nanvav turned her head to make sure Kisar couldn't see her eyes. Their acceleraptors were fluctuating between 300 and 100 feet apart, 
so she could easily hear him. Nan's soul activation has a fun name, BTW. Ignore it, she finally responded loudly. Most of her soldiers knew what was going on. The schizophrenic shouting far off below got a little louder, or maybe everyone else just quieted down. Yay, but... Kisar was interrupted from saying by Nan's almost violent exclamation, it's just some lunatic, ignore him. The tides of the winds were seeding. Right, Ye gave up Kisar, and but uh, that voice. God damn it. Nan's ophidian of the void forced her to say. She then retook control over her full body and voice, throwing her acceleraptor into the front of the flying forces, guiding them more south than east. All right, y'all, for the sake of the two gods, please just be normal. For like ten hours, tops, Lady Commander Nanvav pleaded of her fortress's descending army. Some of them were confused. Kisar and Captain Hotchel were bracing their souls. They almost felt stupid, unintelligent for not noticing Andes. Klon noticed first. He should have been the most worried. Klon and Akon didn't get along. And Andy Vav married in new. That was a while ago. Today was Y-152. The boiled flesh was at war with Parathaneta. He seemed pleased to see them. Look who's talking, kid. You twice as tall as last time, exclaimed Nan's stepdad, Upper Space Admiral of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh. His overwhelming purity made it really, really hard not to remember Akon. All right, yeah, I guess. I was a lot younger last time we saw each other, said Kisar as he thought about all the people who'd died since then. He thought about all the sanguine the fortress of boiled flesh had borne. For some reason, his ophidians danced in the direction of Paleo Jersey, which is north. Kaisar also quickly realized how much dirtier Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav's loose layer of armor was, in comparison to his own, which as a whole was priced higher than most houses that stood within the fortress of boiled flesh. You wanted us to be normal? Captain Hochul clownically asked of Nan as they rode through Andy's campsite, up in the canopies of the inversion jungle, littered with newspapers, unwashed clothes, and prostitutes who, plural, were draped in hundreds of barely conscious mini-demons. Shut up, Huckle, said Lady Commander Nanvav. Ah, it's good chillax I got you guys. See this carving I carved? His Highness, Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav, married in, said while pointing to the carving he'd carved. I'm like Vegeta and you guys are the big minion and the troops are the little minion. What the fuck? This is Kisar speaking, walking while still holding the reins, harnessing his acceleraptor. Hey yo, His Highness, Upper Space Admiral, sir, Clonry mumbled loudly. Settle this for us. Don't I need, like, boats? To be a admiral? Klon asked of Andy Vav. Please shut the fuck up for like two days, please, quickly shouted Kisar to Klon so that he could hear the fully wired Captain Hochul's reasoning. Come on, man. Do you need me to take out a map? You know where we are, Captain Hochul said before hopping back on his acceleraptor and flying as fast as he could away from anywhere near chaos directed. Pirates, barnacled with the stench of the ultraviolet sea, continued tattering the Paleo Jersey bordering edge of the inverse continent. Paratha Neta was still nowhere to be found. Paratha Neta rode her adult male with her east. They lived long and were strong. Her enemies kept their distances. Those who wouldn't dealt with Partha's friends. Livremk was getting along with the rest of their army swimmingly. Shock, on the other hand, was more than a little upset over Livremk Clarity creating a gauntlet out of Corral Partha Neta's previous second deputy's skin and powdered bone, amongst Livremk's other political opinions. More of her people were now speaking English. Shock and Livremk rarely exchanged words. But one day, in the middle of one of their meals, almost immediately after Livremk and Shock worked together to slay a giant ten tons demon, when Livremk finally got Shock to explain part of his forces' formations, Shock explained that it's because of Angelina Rich. The V-Keen, Livremk Declarity blurted out in English. Yay, let me finish, began Shock. Partha's tried killing her multiple times. The black flames she allows certain pirate ships to wave is a symbol of having survived her waters. But there is none Partha Neda has wanted dead who still sees light. Aside from Angelina Rich, Partha says... Bartha Nita told me once that she thinks Angelina Rich is only as powerful as she is because of her Rezoran descent. Bartha Nita will never hide her Rezoros with clothing or armor, but Bartha Nita is not a Rezoran. Declarity, sweetheart, don't talk while you're chewing. You'll make the whole forest smell like saliva, shrieked Bartha Nita in English. Several hundred nearby penises grew in unison. One of the cloaked barbarians feasting nearby had the stones to ask Bartha about Angelina Rich. Bartha Nita responded, She doesn't like me because Le Murderé is bad, don't even get me fucking started. The cloaked question asker chewed, swallowed, and digested Partha's words, while clenching her metal sigh and responding. With a question. Do you know how many people died today? Asked the piss-yellow-haired cloaked assassin as she attacked. I don't. Followed up and concluded the assassin. Angelina Rich. Angelina Rich sees every opportunity as a chance to interfere with communications between the Ophidians of the Void and creation. Her right fist, still tightly clenching onto her silver molar mass 107.8682 sigh, Chomping through Parthaneda's lip and jaw was the first physical attack Parthaneda had directly received in sanguine weeks, not since she was a little sanguine girl, dedicated to tearing apart the forces of those who wronged her family. The blood rained down, only increasing in velocity. Angelina Rich, with only a few hundred allies, 
Most of them infantry grinned through the shining dark night. In name gonna fucking kill we. Parathaneta's soul activation is basically an insta-kill. To describe it literally, for a short duration, she gains the ability to swing around her axe really, really fast. Angelina Rich had never received this attack before, or anything like it, for that matter. But she had witnessed Parathaneta in battle before, many times. And Angelina Rich, who is a woman, has raped the piss out of plenty of older sisters. More than enough to know how to make cunts like Parathaneta scream. If only Parthaneta had known about Angelina Rich's soul activation. She did not. But luckily for her Parthaneta, after Angelina's initial attack, Parthaneta's map of the Vakin's soul sharpened. Immediately following Parthaneta's use of her soul activation, Angelina Rich and her allies began fleeing, sprinting east, and Parthaneta's ophidians painted a voice in her head. Her Razoros, decorating the majority of her 12.3 LB left arm, pulsed. And she remembered hearing the voice of one holy commander, rear admiral at the time, Nishwar Shuda yelling to his son aboard their ship over cannon fire. All you gotta do is beat the snot out of him and yell at them in English or Spanish. Parathaneta was pretty sure Nishvor was talking about the sanguine of the inversion jungle. Parathaneta roared and once again powered a bright pink flash of her soul activation. I'm gonna fucking kill you while exclaiming, you are a star, move like one. The blades tattered left and right, north and south, against and with gravity. As Angelina Rich's paleo Jerseyan forces attempted to flay the crusading ultraviolets, led by Parathaneta, Livremk de Clarity, and Shock. And east they pounded. Kisar just started noticing that despite his breath, he was too dehydrated to sweat. Spending long amounts of time away from home typically added to his anxiety. But this wasn't that. This was just distance. Kisar, Nan, Klon, and their soldiers were several hundred miles east-southeast of the boiled flesh. If anyone died, their gods wouldn't be watching. Their gods wouldn't be... Plus, all their bodies are used to heightened elevation. Hey, thank fuck, Kisar thought as his acceleraptor soared upwards showering both him and it with a hail of cascading sanguine wind. Nan's people were too much. Compared to them, his own troops were an ease to be around. Kizar had Captain Hochul to thank for that. Hochul had been taking Urda and his family's deaths far more intensely than anyone else. And that redirected anguish made itself seen in the young soldiers' united drive. It made sense. Hochul was older than Kizar and most of their friends. Now that he thought about it, that was one thing he noticed within his own troops. As the bright red starless sky above them remained shining hour after hour, Kisar allowed his Ophidians to drown in the love that Captain Hochul had imbued in the young soldiers of the Boiled Flesh's army. Day after day, nightfall after nightfall, aiming the ideals of the Boiled Flesh into their young. Not a proper sentence. When it came to the eye for military strategy, there were none from the Fortress of Boiled Flesh that could compare to Captain Hochul. None their Kisar Nans Klon Re age, at least. Hochul, you better be up to something useful, Kisar's Ophidian of creation sent into his head. Don't fucking disappoint me, said Kizar accidentally, out loud. Hmm? You said something, my lord? One of Kizar Shuda's soldiers asked. I said I have no problem killing anyone close to Parathaneta, responded Kizar, powering through a full sentence of true Sanskrit. A twitch reverberated through their group. Kizar did another count quickly as he could. 500, 200, 300, 300, 300, not including Klon's numbers. Five squadrons, zero defectors. Exactly 2,000 soldiers of the boiled flesh. If Parathaneta still took breath anywhere nearby, we're gonna find her, all of Kizar thought to himself. As the southern lands their acceleraptors flew through grew denser in vegetation and in wild corpse, Kizar began remembering a smell. He looked over to his left to yell out for Klon. Kizar didn't want any of Klonri's mercenaries, even looking in his direction, much less fly over his way to here. But this would be unavoidable. Because right before Kizar could ask Klon if he had ever been here before, Lord Kisar Shuda of the fortress had to put his everything into resisting his soul's own activation. A new feeling, as the past few weeks had been proving normal. Kisar looked up ahead at the glimmering cyan armor he knew belonged to, Captain Hochul's Acceleraptor. Hochul and his Acceleraptor descended faster than anyone could react. All were quiet, waiting for one of their leaders to initiate the interaction. Captain, Hochul provided his report. Captain Hochul is a very eloquent orator. The day is Wamalikorn 53. Lord Kisar. I come bringing a message for the leaders of the boiled flesh. Parthaneta has begun bombarding the Cathedral of Failed Hail. Kisar and Nan have known Captain Hochul for a while. Clown 2 BTW. He never spoke in pure English. Captain Hochul increased his volume to silence the growing concern in the surrounding crowd of allies. On the third day of the fifth week, her assault on the cathedral's northern walls began. Her. Shh, fuck, Kisar. It's bad. I it's... Fuck, sorry, fuck. Parthaneta has one million allies, at the least. The attack shows no sign of slowing or stopping. Kisar used his soul activation to spray some of the water in his flask onto Captain Hockel's overheating, exhausted face. Thanks, man. 
Captain Hochul thanked, while making eye contact with Lord Kizar Shuda of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh. Did you see her? No, responded Captain Hochul. Kizar took five full seconds to think. In absolute silence, even the bugs crawling on the dangling, rotting vines around their pack seemed to be trying to listen in on his thoughts. Kizar saw a map of his continent in his imagination. The boiled flesh, Riavaria, and the UV to the west. Paleo Jersey up north and the Cathedral and Ugildig River to the far east. She's not running away, Kizar thought with horror. She's making sure she has enough runway. No, that, that wouldn't even be a suicide mission. That it, if, her goal, if she begins her attack on all the, he paused, in Verison, from the east, then. It doesn't matter who's leading who. She can just disappear. Any ultraviolent who wants to return home will have to tear through the inverse, from coast to coast, deserter or follower, surviving the way they've been ought. But that's the move of someone who wants to maximize their end. It still smells like a death throw. Kizar couldn't stop his fingers from shaking, but only right now did he start focusing on the tremble, seeing if it was even possible to stop. He tried imagining what wasn't labeled on the map. At any target, Paratha Nada's numbers hoped to acquire. Kisar's ophidians flew. The failed hail has been known to work with pirates before, and there are rumors regarding the deviant's true ideologies. But his wars are not ours. He fights for his planet, his demons, and the gods of chaos directed. Could they know? That's too unlike her. I refuse to believe she doesn't have something. I refuse to ignore this voice telling me she's had us in checkmate for weeks, thought Kisar's internal ophidians of the void and creation. The idea. Is that it? If she does invade from the east, there will be dozens, if not hundreds, of sanguine that'll try and blend in. Giving up their lives for work by the cathedral or immoral farms? Total execution. She wields that like a blade because she's terrified. This way her ideas will never die. She'll force them into our guts until we're one. Meanwhile, Paratha ripped out her 30-inch long, Jesus Christ, those veins are huge, do the sanguine have steroids yet? Arm from one of another dead sanguine's holes. The hole had mostly been opened by her blood-covered arm. It was already covered in blood before this whole thing. <laughs> the cathedral must have been home to well over $200,000-$200,000. A six-dimensional meteor tore through the seventh dimension interaction and was on a direct collision course with the 6D shape that was Kizar's soul. That meteor, the idea that Parathaneda has attacked the cathedral, the soul star, house should, and the fortress of boiled flesh, the planet, Kisar should the shoulda. Hey, Tony Blacksmith here. The DDH is a single sound, the demon meteor that was, the idea that Parathaneda attacked the Cathedral of Failed Hail split into two. The idea that it was true and the idea that it wasn't. Then, it grew again. All the reasons why began branching off. All the possible sizes of her attacking force began spewing implications in Kizar's focus. What the actual fuck is even going on anymore, Kizar thought. What am I a part of? He was special, he knew that. Smarter than others, better than others. Not just born with noble wealth, but created with divine royal obligation. He was the should. He was the boiled flesh, Kisar Shudd was the sanguine. But this creature, this echo of the void, she eluded him. Her every whim shattered his perceived futures. Everything she did created hypocritical, contradictory ideas that clashed against each other whenever he tried to focus on his present self. She was a destruction. She denied his faith in his blood. Lord Kisar Shuda gave his statement while looking to Lady Commander Nanvav for body lingual approval. The Cathedral of Failed Hail is 2,000 miles east of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, and I am in financial debt to the Deviant. This part was all in English. This next part, Kisar said in a blend of Italian and Spanish, we are going to go meet with the farmers. The demon. That's the idea of a sentence that ends on a preposition danced. An angel that guards and guides sentence structure sounded its horn. Lai Frank was busy commanding his ophidians to ward off the demon that's the idea of purified rage, because he was in the middle of watching one of the mightiest brawls his existence had ever allowed. Shock, second deputy of Parathaneda, was engaged in mortal combat with a man whose name none of them knew, but whose garbs and soul made more than enough obvious. Shock's opponent was the Conductor, a top-ranking former official of Chaos Directed, the Conductor of the Deviant's Orchestra. In the city-state of Chaos Directed, during the early days at least, the orchestra had been the largest, by far, hub of economic fluctuation. Who can say if this had anything to do with why the Conductor of the Orchestra took up arms with Chaos Directed's Northern Chancellor in order to rebel against the Deviant? Unfortunately, known to very few, until the first uprising in Chaos Directed, at least, was that Chaos Directed's Northern Chancellor was, in fact, the Deviant. A clone the Deviant had created using his soul activation, as the archangel that guards guides and links one history. The rebellion failed miserably and the conductor had fled. And now he had been found. Five Hearth and Nada's army, as they stormed west, hoping to escape back home to the ultraviolet sea. Livrank de Clarity rode atop his armored acceleraptor, with three of his concubines holding on for dear life, because they are very high up. He commanded his forces to watch and not interfere. Parthanetta was there too. It was a horde, not an army. 
There were literally hundreds of thousands of sanguine, hailing both good and evil from Paleo Jersey, the Inversion Jungle, and all corners of the Inverse Continent, chasing her down, hoping to tear her head from her shoulders. Angelina Rich was one of them. So was the Holy Prince of the Cathedral of Failed Hail. The Cathedral of Failed Hail is still being bombarded. Maratha Neta spoke. Because the conductor is stronger than shock, a lot stronger, and the conductor is not gonna win. What kind of guy do y'all think that my shock is? Asked their leader, Partha Neta. Shock is the kind of guy who doesn't like it. When his enemies aren't focusing on him, Declarity informed his underlings as the blood, spit, and tears continued armoring the sanguine air of the inverse continent. Shock's acceleraptor flapped its wings, pushing them both several meters upwards while Shock brought his steaming bronze club down, and the conductor tossed his lasso around Shock's acceleraptor's legs. They're all flying BTW. Shock thundered with his throat chakra, peak and stumble. Shock has a tattoo on his back of an earthling whom he would call Odin. Shock of Barathaneta's army can use his soul activation, along with his demonic contracts, in order to channel the energy released by tectonic collision into vertigo within the souls of others. Kaisar on his armored acceleraptor a flying dinosaur thing landed. There were dozens of them already there, standing along an armored and fortified bridge next to a sign that still read, Immoral Farms. The rumors were right, a fidian of creation. You seem to be down one? Kisar Englishly muttered through his teeth. Contadini. Sedici. He spat out. These peasants were vassals of the Deviant. How the Deviant could be any one of them, or all of them. The fifteen members of the Sedici Contadini each wore metal helmets, engraved with markings hailing Chaos Directed, the Cone of Dias Pitar, and of course, Memorial Farms. They were tough, not just in body, but in soul, and that other thing. Chefin and Morale addressed the Lord of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, we apologize. Farthaneta did not dare trespass on our farmlands. For Nair Moral added, we chose to ignore her, but we are not your enemies. Not relevant, she is coming, and not lightly. Kizar warned, you and your home will not be a memory, but less than a decoration. You damned us all fools. And what of it? Dared to question Noe's morale, 14th of the Sedici Contadini. Kizar Shuda cleared his throat. The sanguine of the inverse cliffs and of Il Focolare were here, together, for the first time in history. Their enemies mattered not, nor their ideals. He took his chance with a tone designed to deafen. What do you choose? Will you allow the tide of fate to squash you and everything you hold dear just so you can remain in heaven the knowledge that you died where you lived? Or can you abandon everything, except your very selves, holding on to the memory and the culture of these lands, guarding those seeds with your lives until you can regur... Kizar was saying, and, okay, okay, all right, fuck. Chefin interrupted, angrily, tu recte. She gave Moral Farms and Il Focolare a series of final looks. We get it. They understood the play. It took only hours. And tens of thousands of hands, sanguine and lesser, to help evacuate Il Focolare. It was now nothing more than a dummy, a target for their enemies to fire at in order to buy time to charge power. This is war. The ultraviolets were coming. Lots of them. Wella Amoral was the one to face-to-face -face ask Kizar what their plan was for the sanguine living south, by the inversion jungle. Kizar's plan was that there was none. The Inverisen Alliance needed obstacles in the way, if they wanted any chance of surviving as many barriers in front of their final frontier. Kisar left his squadron to seek private shelter, to trim his fingernails. By the time Il Focolare had been completely emptied and abandoned, the fifth sanguine week reached its end. The one called the Constant, Siddharth, whose soul is the demon that's one, was no longer calling himself the name listed on his Earth birth certificate, and was more than 1,000 miles north of the inverse continent. The sanguine of Il Focolare did what they were told. Dispersed as they were, however, None could avoid the bright displays of their former houses and homes going up in blood and smoke, being raided by wild animals, demons, and competing ultraviolet scavengers, all hoping to return to a life they could lead as their own. Kite cried. Her children comforted her. Meanwhile, as the carnage roars on, coalescing at the beginning of the sixth week, Sanguine Y161, Kizar is getting ready to share a moment with another soul born strong. He doesn't quite know it, but it is felt. Kizar walked through the soon-to-be battleground, a few miles east of the River McVook, and remembered something his father, Nishfor Shuda, said once at a banquet held in his majesty, Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav's honor. They're both progressives. That's the problem with how far right Paratha Neda is. Kisar didn't agree. We're just at that age, right? Time to relax is gonna go away for a minute? Kisar asked to the open, empty air, receiving responses from only the chirping bugs of Planet Sanguine's South Pole, until, your politics are more belief-dependent than that. It's bad to short-sell yourself, was said by the woman. She smelled really good, to Kisar at least. Aside from the micro-critters of the night, they were the only two there. He calmed his soul and thought to himself quickly, poor Viles. He has dedicated a more than decent portion of his life to this, and so has she. Their souls are at the same place, maybe not the same position, but in a cosmic sense, perfectly parallel. What are you doing here? asked Kisar. I want to smell the air before the fighting starts, said she. She was taller than him by inches. 
Kisar Shuda couldn't help himself from checking her out. It was dark out, and also quiet. Their necks were already less than a meter apart. His hand was on the hilt of his sword. Her battle axe was nowhere to be found. Kaisar's Ophidian of the Void forced him to grab at her right ear, underneath the skull of the dead demon the woman was wearing. I was told your hair was thicker. Their foreheads collided. And you know nothing about me, the woman said before stealing a three-second taste of Kizar's tongue. Kizar placed his fingers on her hips hard, through the bone and muscle and sanguine fat and blood. Her told her that there are real crazies among the Inverisan Alliance. You should dot BMO re careful. In between breaths as she helped him take off all his armor. They took a moment to stop and gaze at each other. I don't mind you, you're pretty, she told him. Wrap around me, she instructed. I am, he insisted while pumping her insides with himself. No, put your hands on my spine. Moistly exhaled Parthenera as they both fell to the sanguine grass beneath them. Kisar Shuda on top. He clenched her hair to get to her back and began, for some reason, gnawing at her jaw and making some noises that I, Tony Blacksmith, am going to go ahead and not describe. The smell of nearby corpse, demon, sanguine, and animal all mixed together in the inverse air wasn't enough to mask what the two were creating. We have to be careful, Kizar managed to get out in between his furious thrusts. Just finish inside me, I won't let a single drop leak, assured the sweat and saliva soaked Parthenetta. Okay, he said barely, while whimpering. It was over slower than it started. And a day change in sky color from bright to dark, then bright again, later on Sanguine Y162, the gray and grizzly chef in Emoral, with 6166 peasants of Emoral Farms, arrived at the southeastern shores of the River McVuck with their demon killing beasts and a craving for ultraviolet blood. Nose Moral dismounted his wife's hexer sign and addressed the hell masked Kisar Shuda. There are more on their way 13,000 of Paleo Jersey, as well as 3,000 from the Cone of Dios Pitar, given that we turn blades towards the Deviant once Parathanita has been slain. Including all the armed and ready sanguine of Il Focolare, we will have about 40 and 3,000 warriors enraged and at your service, Lord Shuda. Kisar knew the numbers. 24,000 soldiers from the Fortress of Boiled Flesh here and ready, saturated to their limit with bloodlust, protected by armor and blades manufactured in chaos directed by the Deviant. 110,000, 11,000 gathered remnants from the fallen settlements along the river McVook and Inversion Jungle made up most of the forces on the western shore of the river McVook, where the river eventually bled out and joined the Ultraviolet Sea and Paleo Jersey Waterfalls. Jersey Waterfalls. 180,000. 18,000 lives supported his hastily put together alliance commanded by House Shuda, the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, and the Sedici Contadini. Captain Hotchel was high in the sky on his Acceleraptor, leading the formation of the youngest recruits, ensuring each and every one of them were getting to know each other's souls. They'd need it. Clonray and his mercenaries, Nanvav, her entire battalion, and all their armored platoons were slowly yet steadily fortifying the skies and fields east of the river. Kisar's father, Lord Holy Commander Nishwar Shuda, was holding the eastern shore, commanding one of the largest ships the Inverisan Alliance had at their disposal. The River McVuck was far too large to patrol and monitor, especially now with the numbers they had. Yet it was the most obvious route to escape back to sea. Andy Vav and his army were guarding the western shore, all grounded, all ready to clean up any fallen sanguine that ended up in freefall acceleraptors are not easy to kill. Nan was refusing to tell Kizar where her mother was, which was unfortunate, because in truth, Nan's mother alone could halt most of the Inverison alliance while drugged and barehanded. But if even Nan had to keep a tight lip, it was probably something relevant, Kisar's faith soared. He did one last internal dance to ensure that his war with Parathaneta would be contained to the River McVuck, fearing the absolute worst in the deepest crevice of his very soul. No, right? Yes, I'm correct. She can't let this army stand. It's large. The sheer quantity of soul? The mass of what this group of soldiers could do over our lifetimes is vast. Yet the cloud of uncertainty being tamed by the ophidian of creation. It's bigger. She has to take us down. She won't flee. Okay, Kisar thought to himself. He sat back and stroked his short beard with his left fingers. What would I do if I were her? If I wanted to make every one of us go away, Ilfokalar and the jungle are gone. They're dead. Kill her now. I'm Partha, Kisar thought. I want to escape back home. I'll use my strength to tear through any resistance. I attacked the river, then the cathedral. To hurt the boiled flesh? Are we really her prime focus? Be the villain. Imagine their plight. Empathize their souls interjected the ophidian of creation. Kizar had one main question. Perhaps because all things want to defend their birth. But would she send any significant force towards the cliff? Her goal is destroying the forces at the Makvok. It has to be. Long term, she wants the boiled flesh writhing in agony, unable to cry for help. But right here, right now, what can she want to do? I have to believe she won't. Maybe she'll be attracted to our sanguinity in some kind of worst-case scenario. But if we can throw away the jungle and Il Focolare, then she has no choice but to assume that we'll allow the boiled flesh to fade away. Our forces hold the river. Kaisar became overtaken with every possible configuration of troop deployment. 
If literally every capable fighter left the cliff for the River McVuck, how likely was it that Partha would pick up the smell of Target and run to their home? How likely was it that they could stop her? What would stopping her look like? Partha was a wrecking ball, not a heat-seeking missile. Even, even she was mortal. She had desires. She missed her home. He knew her. More than most that walked his planet. If, in sight of the river, she'd be guided by her own, she wouldn't head for the flesh. She'd do whatever it took to destroy the beast in front of her. That's my job, Kizar thought. Out nay, we will build a demon, a multi-sanguine legion worthy of ending your tale. He and his acceleraptor roared the hum of the boiled flesh's anthem, that they'd both been sung to since birth, to gas the absolute raging fuck out of the forces swarming the river McVuck. Where the blooded sanguine of the proud nation that would soon be known by all as Inveris would make their first united stand. The idea of hyperactivity festered. 180,000 of the Inverisen Alliance against the millions of sanguine hunting and guarding Parthenita of the ultraviolet sea. The momentum of the Big Bang has likely been conserved across all things in reality. This is quite impressive when considering the mass and velocity of all things aggregate. Hey, Parada, Livremp declared he scrome over warfire. I don't like it when men call women bitches, hee <laughs> hee. Livremp grunt laughed as he pointed his right thumb up against the flow of gravity and his smile at her. Levremk, draped in blood and vomit leaking severed intestines, took notice of his heart's beat. Ah, okay, Partha Nada responded not that loudly as she was killing West. Partha has yet to use her soul activation since she had sex with Kisar. Alongside the sixth week of the first sanguine year, the defense of the river McVuck. Begins, a messenger riding an acceleraptor bred and equipped for agility delivered the report. My lord, Commander Kisar Shuda. By our counts, Partha Nada and her forces. The messenger bit his lip, swallowed his fear, and continued to report. They number well over 2,000,000 2, housing. The demon that's the idea of fear was doing some back over on Earth. Right, Kisar responded. What we expected, he said as he clanked his helmet with his right wrist twice to hype up him, his acceleraptor, and his allies, which in total barely numbered 18,000 less than a tenth of their enemies. On Earth, by humans, Parthenata's forces would be called invaders. The formation Parthenata's forces took as they rode west towards the River McVuck would likely remind many of one of Odin's letters, Laguz. It was mostly instinct. They followed no chain of command, mostly. The demon. That's the idea of Laguz grumbled and bellowed, both at the same time, within the realm of pure ideation. Squids and girls, here's why you play we money, commanded Kisar Shuda for some reason. Not really sure. Partha's cunt has been on his mind. Clonray took advantage of the roaring crowd to add a little, Kisar kind of feels like an older brother that's not the oldest brother. Y'all know him, Zayn? A very yang yizir rumbled throughout the troops. They were good at that. The sky was brilliant and clear, a deep warm purple, some might call it bluish lavender, clouds so few you could count them. Clonry's mercenaries had murdered all nearby demons, and their rotting corpses warded off most large animals. The battlefield was clear. The troops were united, their directive firm. Prevent ultraviolets from returning once they come. And kill Partha Nada. A burble burbled in the distance. The bloody heaving ceremoniously buzzed above the dampened dirt beneath their charging bodies. The first wave in sight appeared to be a mere force of 64,000. Pirates. Their souls were doused with the salt of the ultraviolet sea. Infantry, all of them. Some didn't even carry blades. There wasn't a firearm to be seen. Most did not have armor. 64,000 pirates. They seemed hungry. Wave one. The bad guys race west. Clonry and Captain Huckle head the charge to meet them. Clon and his 4,000 mercenaries made up the Inverison Alliance's left wing. And Captain Hoshel led the Inverison Alliance's right, with 6,500 young, almost rabid soldiers of the boiled flesh. The 10-500 blades stormed into the mad, raving torrent of westbound ultraviolet scavengers, long tired after their various expeditions during this set of wars. Kisar, with his 4,500 soldiers, Lady Commander Nanvav, and her 7,000 soldiers stood firm and remained ready to back up the Inverison Alliance's left wing, while 3,000 deviant-wronged sanguine of the Cone of Dios Pitar and Chefin and Moral, leading 6,000 sanguine of the former Il Focolare, were ready to back up Captain Huckle in the Inverison Alliance's right wing. The right wing was meant to have more support. The support was late. Far too late, Captain Hoshel worried. His sword shined brighter than any piece of gem or armor on the battlefield's right. Nearly all the fighting was still several dozen miles from the River McVuck itself. Parathaneda was nowhere to be seen. But it was hard to see, to be fair. Captain Hoshel knew what he was doing. But it was painfully clear to everyone losing blood that Clonry and his mercenaries were better suited for this style of warfare. The wave of 64,000 ultraviolets had no shape. It had no leaders. Yet their direction was clear. The adrenaline-pumping army of evil sanguine compressed their warfare towards Captain Huckle and his less experienced troops. They would be the bottleneck used to break out to the river. Back home, the commander of the first wave finally made his face seen, as well as his enormous clanking acceleraptor's armor heard, 
as he shouted the name of his soul activation among the chaos. Or peak and stumble. Friend and foe, good and bad. When one vomits, it invites others to join. Sanguine fell. Sanguine tripped over the sanguine that fell. Sanguine men and women, drunk on blood and screams, dropped their weapons out of a slippery lack of care. Bodies fell onto blades, young and old. Clon Ray and his mercenaries slowly stopped making ground, and Captain Hoshel's troops felt beneath their feet their own ground being pushed back. Back towards the river, back into the 3,000 sanguine from the cone of Dias Pitar, and the 6,000 led by Shafin Moral. Vigkite Moral was still nowhere to be seen. She was supposed to be leading her forces north to block the first wave of ultraviolets from breaching too far south, where they could still make it into the river. So Captain Hockle used his soul's activation for the planet they named Dwarf Draugr to push the ultraviolets east. Captain Hochul of the Inverse Continent's Fortress of Boiled Flesh can turn any form of carbon into pure, pure ice, with varying degrees of strain, of course. Way kite, where the fuck are you? Captain Hochul demanded over his screaming soul. An idea grew. The idea that Parathanera, at the very least, would escape this war. The idea that she'd make it back to her home. And the idea that this was all for nothing. The wave of 64,000 on 64,000 pirates began thumping southwest, their escape nigh. By the mid of the seventh week, her corpse will be buried, assured Kizar to his antsy mini-army, realizing that the cause of all the chaos behind them, further north where the river McVuck bled out to sea, must have been none other than the Constance Majesty, supreme leader of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, mother to Nanvav, wife to Andyvav, Nanvav, the Inverisen Alliance's mightiest blade, ten hours into the defense of the river McVuck. Sangreen Y165, the pirates were bleeding through. In minutes, there would be hundreds of them wading the shallow waters of the river McVuck's eastern coast, the few barely armed battleboats that lined the river McVook continued to fire, under the orders of the Lord Holy Commander Niish Shuda and His Highness the Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav. The pirates were making it through. Drops of red grew into craters in the rushing river. Parthenetta was nowhere to be found. Shock was being chased back by Klon's mercenaries. Captain Hockle's sword painted the battlefield with steaming blood. Lady Commander Nan Vav and Lord Commander Kisar Shuda had already begun their battles east of the river with their thousands of soldiers at hand. The sanguine that called the river their home, alongside Chefin, Morrill and her troops were in charge of guarding the lands around and beyond the river, and ensuring that Partha Netta was found only right before she was killed. The second wave of bad guys had well past entered. From the southeast was one Levremk de Clarity, with legions of evil sanguine behind him numbering 80,000. From the northeast was a woman, with three armies trailing fast behind all charging south. 10,000, 20,000, and 50,000. The Inverison Alliance's left and right armies now each had to deal with an additional 80,000 enemies. Livrimk de Clarity's forces tore into Captain Hochul's. De Clarity had yet to activate his soul, or rather he'd yet to find the proper conditions. Klan Ri, on the Inverison Alliance's left wing, was busy attempting to corner shock as his rampant spread of pirates made it impossible for Klan's mercenaries to establish any lasting formations. Nanvav had abandoned the right wing. Right, yeah, so since Shefan Amoral is over there, and it looked like pirates were going to be breaking past the river anyway, and since Vykite Amoral was only just now showing up, yes, she was waiting for Nan to abandon her post, with 20,000 soldiers of Il Focolare from the southeast to block Shock's pirates, Lady Commander Nan Vav took her 7,000 soldiers northwest to lighten the burden on Kizar's forces. And also, because the woman leading the 80,000 additional sanguine now adding to the waves of bad that assaulted the Inverison Alliance's left wing, was Angelina Rich. And Angelina Rich is what you'd call a bloodbender. This interests Nan. Ursina Shai Angelina Rich's soul activation. An avatar-type blood manipulator? The crashing foam of sanguine bodily fluids provided an easy canvas for Angelina Rich's metal sigh. She couldn't swing it around as fast as Parathenaida did with her axe, but with Angelina's soul activation in this little battlefield, there were none that could even stand close. The woman surfed the waves of red with a grin. The woman. Corpses didn't have a chance to fall. While the other leaders of the Inverse and Alliance were busy keeping their formation stable and tracking the enemy leaders, Angelina Rich's SI seized and slashed through Lady Commander Nan Vav's veteran squadrons, drowning out their wails of sorrow with her hiccups of post-pubescent raw satisfaction. It was as if the neglected gods of the wind were choosing Angelina Rich's right arm as a host for their war against the idea of needed perception. Shapes and letters, simple yet barely complex in the tongues and scribbles of the ancients, occasionally made themselves seen within the undulating masses of blood Angelina Rich was whipping around with her soul activation. Nan's troops had more mobility, but for the weakest among them, this only provided ease of access to the V-Keen's blade. His Highness, Upper Space Admiral, grabbed a spare, well-rested Acceleraptor and abandoned his ship. He and his steed javelined northeast. To his stepdaughter's fight, the pirates' numbers vastly surpassed their own. Yet Nan and her forces still found themselves able to determine their target. Lady Commander Nan Vav of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh can inhale and exhale simultaneously, using her soul's activation. She named her soul activation Constant Drive. 
It was not helping. The Inverison Alliance meant little to the Vikine. The obvious mass of Nan's soul aside, Angelina was only here to finally digest some old beef. Using her soul activation on the deteriorating soldiers and berserkers around them would make it easier. Angelina Rich is not an architect or anything like that, but she's walked along bridges. None of the bridges she'd known, however, could hope to match the rapidly built arc of tears and blood she was gliding along, dozens of feet above the River McVuck's waters. And almost as if it were easy, Angelina Rich, standing tall, had made it west of the River McVuck. Among the smoldering victims and casualties of the warring weeks prior, she cleared her throat to make sure everyone who could hear her would, Emma, wait here for Parathaneta, make sure she don't get away. Nan prepared her troops to make way for Angelina. Seeing Andy stopped her. Seeing Andy stopped. The Lord Holy Commander Nishvar Shuddha sounded the order, and seconds after his voice infected the air, the hundreds of sanguine whose souls were specialized for defense activated, creating a wall of rushing water of the river McVuck, which would end up flooding the western shore, but nonetheless trapping Angelina Reach on the western front, while also preventing the almost flying Parathaneda from diving with her wither into the river's waters. Nishvar was the only one who could see her. He didn't have to activate his soul. She was extremely high up. Falling, almost. From the wrong side. The Constant is here because he fucked up. The Deviant is here on a mission, said Angelina, unprompted. This statement, while brief, was said with enough rigid intent to convince His Highness Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav that her day of death was upon them. Crowner's Quest Law. His Highness Upper Space Admiral Andy Vav's soul activation. Only works around corpses. Kisar did not get it at the time. He did not understand these acts until long after he became a father, after this war. But for measurement's sake... The moment at which Kisar began to fully accept that he did not understand the fortress of boiled flesh's patriotic will was when Nan Vav, their supreme leader and the Constance Majesty, deep within herself, on the western front, less than a mile northeast of Parthaneda, activated her soul. Devastation. The supreme leader of the inverse continent's fortress of boiled flesh can convert O3 to O2 by activating her soul. Her name is Nan Vav. Good nay, great place to see our sun star day. Proclaimed the supreme leader of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, Nan Vav, at the dawn of the eighth day of the first week, Y-168, as her soul activation poured down hellfire from the clouds above. Chemical reactions tend to rapidly produce heat. 64,000 pirates led by shock, 8,000 bandits led by Levremk de Clarity, and 8,000 hunters following Angelina Rich had completely obscured the western grounds of the River McVuck. Kite's 2,000 sanguine of Ilfocolari were doing their job of keeping the enemies from penetrating south, but at the heavy cost of allowing Angelina Rich and Nan Vav's fight to completely bottleneck Captain Hotchell's younger forces. The sky was bright. The water was dark. Niishfer's ship, Kisar's unit, and Klonry's mercenaries had become the core of the war. Their three forces prevented Angelina Rich's allies from surrounding the river's bend from the north and provided enough of a deterrent to leave Remk to clarity, separating him from Shock's forces. A splashing splash splashed louder and louder further west as Kisar shouted at the top of his lungs, I fucked her, you know! as he chased shock across Angelina's hastily produced bridge. Nan Vav, supreme leader of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, was still activating her soul. The heat grew. Her armored body descended. The color in the sky decreased. And the ozone in Sanguine's atmosphere began to hiss. There were maybe thousands of Angelina Rich's followers north of all the fighting that were being halted by the violent desecration of the air they needed to inhale. But they were not Nan Vav's target. Nan Vav's target was the slishing splash that was sloshing its way down the river McVuck. Nan Vav's target was the sanguine woman riding her adult male wither along the river, on a direct collision course with Nishvor Shuda's battleship. Parthaneda was having the time of her life. It was clear to see. She swung around her weapon, for no other reason than to fill the collective perception around her with blindness. Kizar saw too much. To apply a concrete value of measurement, Parthaneda, when activating her soul, typically reaches an average murder rate of 10 lives per second, and she can hold her soul activation for far longer than a second. Her blade bounced against the air itself to ricochet into the skulls of her enemies. Kisar judged in an instant that he didn't care how Livremk was still alive. Dad, blow her head off! Kisar yelled and, Nan, occupy de clarity! He added right before activating his soul. Pure Viles, Lord Commander Kisar Shuda of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, can use his soul activation to transfer liquids between containers. The sanguine good and bad close to death felt their pores grow wide. Then wider, then just a teensy tiny bit wider, as Kizar used his soul activation to draw out every ounce of their collective liquids he could towards the Vikine's attacking arm. Nan Vav could essentially levitate with her application of her soul activation. She was faster than Paratha Neda, and Nan increased her speed as her shining armor and sword tore through the air she claimed as her own. Paratha Neda was less than 30 meters from Niishvor's battleship. She was taking fire, but they didn't have cannons nearly accurate enough. Fort Yerda, said the leader of the 4,000 mercenaries, Klon Ray, as he dove, attacked, and activated his very soul. Splash. Klonri's soul activation has to do with virtual singularities. 
His Acceleraptor retracted its wings and tucked its scaly feathered neck diving down. Klon's mercs took their shape, that of a bending river of light. Listen well, our children. History is far from over, goaded Lord Holy Commander Nishvar Shuddha of the Inverse Continent's Fortress of Boiled Flesh. And as he finished, and as the following waves died down, Parthaneta inquired loudly, Has my name become forbidden yet? Klon Ray grabbed the hair of the disconnected sanguine head he was holding, began spinning it like a nunchaku, and then flung Shock's cabeza at the jumping Parthaneta. Parthaneta was already activating her soul, swinging her axe far faster than anyone could understand to block the incoming assault as she boarded the enemy ship. Destroying Shock's head as it flew into her range was nothing. She prepared to engage the target. Nishvor refused to leave his post. The river was swarming with barely conscious men and women telling themselves whatever they could to survive until the next sky. He continued to fire. The screams crescendoed. Nan, Vav, and Kite were barely handling Livremk's forces. As Shock's raging subordinates joined what was left of Parathaneda's army, which could hardly be seen as a united front. Kisar was more than busy attempting to dismantle Angelina Rich's followers, while Andy Vav and the Sanguine of the River were making sure Angelina and Paratha didn't have the chance to convene. Sheffin had abandoned guarding the river. There was no point. Sanguine stormed and flooded the lands and waters that weren't theirs, so Sheffin Amoral took her 6,000 Sanguine and made their way to save Captain Hockle from near certain death, east of the river. She could smell the importance within his wails of aggression. Thousands and thousands of evil sanguine would escape back to the ultraviolet. There was absolutely no avoiding it. Some of them might even end up targeting the fortress of boiled flesh. But that wasn't an issue. None of that mattered. The severity of the gap in strength may be hard to empathize with. But what does not require empathy is understanding the desire to slaughter, a simple spawn of the need to eat. Parathaneta was in plain sight. Her number one had been beheaded publicly in battle. Nanvav, visibly descending onto the battlefield, was near akin to Christ himself being revealed during the days of man's decay. Yet even she knew deep in her soul that every single breath they allowed Parathaneta to steal was a loss for each and every soul in the Inverisan Alliance. Parathaneta yelled three words. The morning of Sanguine Y169 was creeping in. She said, at near super Sanguine volume, Ich, Bin, Heis! And like Poseidon commanding the waves, thousands of Sanguine west of the river immediately inverted their direction and began fleeing east. Kizar felt his soul become tainted with malice. She's fucking toying with me, he selfishly thought. The demons started taking what they could. Klonray's soul activation allowed him and his mercenaries to fight well beyond their limits. But against Partha Neda, it was like attempting to murder a mosquito with a fighter jet. Her and her beast, totaling hundreds of pounds, thunked and cracked every surface the two came into contact with. Andy Vav and Klonray both found themselves overcome with the exact same thought. We are about to die. And Partha Neda continued to kill. It was unclear what drove her. Lord Commander Kisar Shuda was beginning to feel responsible. Either most of the messengers were dead, or Captain Hotchel was. Or both. Kite had circled around the invading army, making sure no mass of worth could retreat east, but this left the right wing unguarded, driving Kizar to abandon the left wing to destroy the stream of evil sanguine making it over the river on the bridge of collapsing, coagulated blood Angelina Ritchie had left behind. This conflict has been described as a war, but in truth the word war is used to encapsulate the number of lives being thrown around. These were not U.S. Navy SEALs fighting armed terrorists. These were not patriotic warriors of a centuries-old nation serving for their history. These were millions of infant adults, creatures less than 365 days old, yet capable of the thought and action of a grown and tested adult. They did not know battle strategy, yet they knew how to hunt. They knew not of the tragedies humanity has brought upon itself, but they were more than familiar with the rage that death provides to life. The good guys were losing. Lady Commander Nan Vav, who'd one day lead the Fortress of Boiled Flesh as the Constance Majesty, was covering Clonray's back. Her and her flying Acceleraptor were exhausting most of their remaining energy guarding Nishvor's battleship, attempting to prevent Partha's allies from joining her. Klon dropped his sword. He still stood tall, but he was so tired he could barely breathe. Nan landed on the ship, dismounted her steed, took the vial of cocaine from her pocket, crushed it, and forced it up her Acceleraptor's snout, telling it to go wild. She looked at Klon. Re, you left because our ways were wrong, because we punished what we viewed as sickness. I can't promise to change this world we're being forced to fight for. But if you want to come back home after we kill that bitch, then I'll change it, dumb fuck. Trust me, she ordered the barbarian Ree. She couldn't handle him dying. Not here. Not now. Constant drive. Lady Commander Nanvav can exhale and inhale at the same time. Her eyes were drying up. Most of the Alliance's boats were going up in flames as pillagers commandeered the smaller vessels to escape. Lord Holy Commander Nish Vershudas was making noise. Hard drummed Paratha Neta. The Vakeen of Paleo Jersey, Angelina Richer burst out laughing as the hype Paratha Neta had fueled into her troops almost instantly vanished, seemingly simultaneously with one well placed cannon shot by Niche Forshuda, right in the center of Livremk's body. 
Cannonballs move pretty fast, so Livremk's body popped, as did his dinosaur. Sole survivor, Livremk's resurrected body grabbed onto the ship that had shot him down. He began to climb. Exhausted sailors of the ship jumped down to kill him and his allies as they fell. The secret of his survival had been seen. Il Focolare was no more. They were a people with no houses to return to. Farmers whose crops danced in the sanguine sky as smoke and heat. They followed the fortress of boiled flesh, out of fear for the destroyed cathedral in the Far East. Tens of thousands of homeless peasants, hands and shoulders cracked and calloused with the labors of slave owning and property management. It would be an understatement to say that those of the Inverisan Alliance blamed the farmers for allowing Bartha Neda to prance along the continent she believed her own. However, the Inverisan Alliance existed to kill Bartha Neda. Sheffin and Kite had nearly grouped together, creating a border to the south, increasing their enemy's westbound velocity. The Fortress of Boiled Flesh led the Inverisan Alliance. Refugees of the river and Il Focolare existed to remind Bartha Netta and her allies that the dead would never stay silent. Bala Amaral chanted something about energy momentum tensors, and then Captain Hochul started glowing. Kite's forces were more than enough to bring Hockel's soldiers out of their stupor, and this gave Sheffin all she needed to guide her 6,000 back west. The trails of smoke should have concealed her movements, and while her hands and feet were hidden to those with widened perception, her directive was translucent. Yet no one could stop them. She landed on Nishvor's ship. Kisar was making his way over. Nan was occupied. The majority of lesser-educated fighters who had no home to return to among the Alliance had given up protecting the remnants of civilization west of the river, instead joining up with the farmers to create a thin, albeit effective, wall to the south, guiding their enemies west towards their upper command and their duels. As the war pushed further and deeper into and past the river, Chefin Moral, leading over 6,000 fighters from the former Moral Farms, soaring dozens of yards in the air, thrust her blade deep into Livremk de Clarity's heart and activated her soul. A flash of red smoke masked Livremk's smile. Chefin staggered. Angelina jumped. Andy swung. Sole survivor. You know what it does. I am gonna fucking kill her. She disappeared. Everyone who had Partha Netta in their sights lost it. This specific activation of Partha Netta's soul lasted less than five full seconds. She killed 47 sanguine adults, not to mention the animals, all armored and dripping with the exhaustion of war. After killing those 47, she dropped her axe and threw a spinning backfist, tearing through Chef and Emeral's armored skull and brain like they were paper mache. The sound and ensuing screams would suggest otherwise. Livremk de Clarity, freshly revived, slashed horizontally through Chefin's headless corpse and sidekicked her tits, launching her upper torso into Noe's morale's blind spot. Kite caught what was once a part of a living person, arriving too late to save her leader. It seemed as if Vykite morale had lost the ability to blink. For the foreseeable future, at least, she will not. Sheffin's former lower body buckled at the knees and most of her insides began spilling out of her severed waist. De Clarity put his right foot on her corpse, looked far beyond Vykite Morrill's eyes, and slyly commanded, come at me, bitch, in a falsetto, which he rarely did. I am gonna fucking kill a sole survivor. They work well together. Everyone could see her. Everyone knew where she was. The way the blood and steam expelled themselves from her body made it seem as if Partha had repulsed every force named and imaginable. Nan Vab descended. More people died fighting. The Inverisan Alliance was formed to kill Partha Neta. That idea was in sight. Weeks of combat would not go to waste, and everyone still breathing new. Unfortunately, being able to see, hear, and smell their target had yet to change the inertia of Partha's chasers and supporters. Kill the commander, and the ship sinks, Niishvor's Ophidians reminded him. Ichiwa, Lord Holy Commander of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, Niishvor should his soul activation. Gets him really, really drunk, so he tries not to let his troops see. Don't get anything wrong. There was a lot of crying and dying going around. It was pretty brutal. But the soldiers of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh had been tested. Lord Holy Commander Niishvor's legions were a few notches above the best. The way they were. The unbelievable manner in which they let their faith carry their despair into the deepest pits of their Ophidian souls, in face of their enemies' overwhelming numbers, would birth tears. Their enemies were not one. The Inverison Alliance did not face a single nation as a threat. But the blades that tore into her forces, they brought Niishvor Shuddha to spastic laughter. My legions are fucking morons, haha, said the Lord Holy Commander of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh. The opening would not be ignored. Taking the unpredictably sloppy move, Partha crashed her weapon's flat side into Nishvor's guard, blasting him into the air, faster west than most of the ultraviolets scampering in the same direction. And everyone, good and bad, double took their focused east, as did Nanvav. Among the collapsing enemy forces that continued adding to their enemy's mass, someone new had arrived. Someone who'd brought change. Amil Etzwal. Planet Sanguine's solar system is very similar to your and my own. The Holy Prince, Noam Ember, of the Inverse Continent's Cathedral of Failed Hail, has a soul with a very, very strong connection with a Neptunian moon. His soul activation is called Hamlet. Among the battalions that waved the flags of Failed Hail, 
very few actually knew anything about the Holy Prince's soul activation. What is known is that aside from Quetzalcoatl, none on planet Sanguine have killed more lives, not even the Deviant. If historians of the planet Sanguine were to be tasked with explaining how exactly the surviving soldiers of the Cathedral of Failed Hail made it to the battlefield when they did, they would most likely guide attention to the Inversion Jungle. Because although there existed no remaining tribes to call the jungle home, when Parathanetta and her forces rampaged from the cathedral to the river, they didn't kill all the animals. Jungle serpents with skin thick enough to be called armor and speed that would enrage adult withers, and Hexersine slithered west, crashing into Captain Hokel's battle. Luckily and clearly, they were on the side of the Alliance. Good had just received unexpected help. To be more precise, roughly 12,000 new souls had finally arrived to the war. The Inverisan Alliance now numbered over 28,280,000. The bad guys still had over a million. Andy Vav retreated from Angelina and her few surviving followers. She had the falling niche for in her sights and took towards the same target. Martha had jumped off his ship with her wither and the sky was beginning to darken. The luring dusk signaled the creeping arrival of Sanguine Y-160, the tenth day of the sixth week. With how chaotic the ravaging destruction west of the river was, Partha could easily disappear. She would be far too exhausted to make it far without stealing a sailing vessel. But regardless, everyone who had been close enough to tear out her throat with their blades would hardly allow her the chance to vanish from their hunt. Not gonna lie, Angelina Rich started to say. Looks tough out there, but I'm gonna win. Cause for some reason, and for some reason, Angelina Rich, who is from Paleo Jersey, pointed her silver sigh towards the glowing Captain Hockle on the other side of the river. And she said, I got an angel with me. I sided with the fortress of boiled flesh. Remember well. For the planet they named Dwarf the Barge Captain Hockle can force any coal to diamond, said Captain Hockle. All while Angelina Richach was spellcasting, blood and bones of the dead and murdered. Become my spine. To counteract Captain Hochel's attack. Unshirin Dakar, Angelina Rich can manipulate the viscosity of blood with her soul activation. Her idol did its job. Captain Hochel's gigantic javelin was blocked. The distraction had allowed one holy commander to penetrate an opening. Very few had noticed. But it was odd, considering those who had the ability to stop him. I don't like, he started saying as he thrust his right. Ha, huh, being this close. She heard him say as the tip of his blade pierced her right eye. To zero, admitted Lord Commander Nish for Shuda immediately before slaying the Paleo Jersey Vakeen, Angelina Rich. He pulled the blade out of her eye socket with such speed that no one realized what occurred. Nishvor changed his target and started sprinting with a tremor that forced all to assume he was retreating from the Vakeen. All but one. She grinned and pointed. You have to see where I am coming from. You see, there are objective scales of superiority, boomed Parathanata as Angelina Rich's corpse fell and skull spurted brain blood. It was vampiric how unanimous the decision to avoid discussing everyone's use of English was. Kisar stood still. How the fuck? Did he do that? Hochul can increase the density of carbon. That's his sole activation. I've known that since. Kisar thought about how long he'd known the captain, as all blades of the Inverison Alliance turned towards the remaining general of evil. Towards Barathaneta. A memory took ownership of Kizar's focus. A memory from his childhood. We were on our bikes. Just riding around, not going anywhere. Just moving. I remember we couldn't stop laughing. There wasn't anything funny going on. It was just pure, unhindered joy. My bicycle was way cooler than Werde's. When the sky set, Klon tried to trick us into robbing a drug dealer. Or something like that. If Hochschel wasn't there, I probably would have gone through with it. Anand didn't talk much back then. There were... Six of us? Right. Hochschel brought the girl he was dating at the time. I'm pretty sure, at least. Yeah. Back then, those two went everywhere together. Him and that weird girl with the teleportation powers. She'd be useful right now. Kisar told everything in his mind to stop thinking. He focused on his gut. And as the exasperated and barely functioning members of the Inverison Alliance grew to know the last day of the sixth sanguine week, the bad guys dropped off one of their final surprises. With the Holy Prince and the farmers fortifying the southern wall of troops, the being known to the Alliance as Captain Hochel looked around. He knew his time was running on fumes. He looked up at the wave of exactly 80 titanic demons, each over 10 tons in mass, flying high in the sanguine sky, leaving mansion-sized craters of shadows where they flew. The one called Hochul used his soul and perceived the mass of the new incoming wave. Each demon as it descended was carrying shy of 9,000 enemy invaders. In total, roughly 700,000 new enemies had been dropped off, with support that the Inverison Alliance was not equipped to halt. Killing Partha Neda is up to them, Hochul thought to himself. Those of us on this side of the river, he thought as he grasped the positions of the Holy Prince and the farmers. All we can do is give them a chance to fight. And so Hoshal, whose given name is actually Arthur, used his shapeshifting as the archangel that guards guides and links one history to grow enough wings on his body to give him the strength he needed. Those demons were his. They'd fall to his blade. Shock doesn't quite describe it. 
but they had to assume whatever it was they were calling Captain Hotchell was still on their side. The deviant yelled, Ghost blood. There was no sign of stopping the westbound torrent. Yet Good continued to hope that the death of Parathanetta would bring their war what they could call in good faith, victory. The Alliance's forces east of the river were close to being decimated, which was in truth quite phenomenal when considering the scale of their opposition. Unfortunately, as the Deep Knight of Sanguine Y-160 continued to fail at masking the whales of the dying, the soldiers barely holding the southern barrier froze and turned their gazes up. Aside from what they were looking at, the falling corpse of a Titanic-class demon, the greatest source of light in the night came over west of the river. At Parathanata's fight, you know knowing. Knows moral soul activation is an environmental type, meaning that he can apply an effect to his surroundings using his body and soul. His ability is not uncommon. By burning away his own lifespan, he can create sparks of heat. The sanguine of Il Focolare and the river could barely see or hear through the fire and echoes of dark-stained freedom their enemies brought with their westward charge, much less configure a method to encircle and trap their target. Nose Moral used his soul activation to destroy any flying debris coming his or his soldier's way, and the high command of the fortress west of the river started coordinating their dashes to place a chokehold on Bartha Neta's movements. The Inverison Alliance still had one goal, kill Bartha Neta. Everything else had to take a seat. All other ideas and the demons they were started staying slightly still in order to watch. Whatever came next would decide the future of this continent. Running to save his father was the only way Kizar could focus on not focusing on what exactly Captain Hokel had been hiding and how he'd been able to accomplish what he was currently accomplishing. Death fueled the hungry, and despite all she had taken, Parthenetta was fucking famished. Don't worry, girl, I'll keep it quiet. For August, at least angrily grunted the grimacing Kizar Shuda in front of all the fighting soldiers nearby as he landed, while showing his teeth to Parthaneta. That was it. Parthaneta had seen a lot of shit during this war. But Kisar saying that. Kisar saying what he did in the way that he did. It got her to give up her axe, but only within the realm of the demons. Within the realm of the demons. Within the realm- Parthaneta finally allowed her battle axe to finally become an avatar of the demon. That's the idea of the strength of a standing army. The pitch was ultraviolet. Paratha jumped. She activated her soul. I'm gonna fucking kill you. Sanguine with a Razorus often have souls that use what they've been granted. Paratha Neda's Razoros covers most of her arm. She's pretty strong. The frequency has floored at 14 murders per second. Captain Hotchell, who is Arthur Swee, the deviant undercover, if that wasn't clear, shredded through the sky at whistling speeds, slicing apart the demons in the sky and their disembarking riders. With those demons and their hundreds of thousands of evil hitchhikers focusing elsewhere, the arriving soldiers of the Cathedral of Failed Hail would be able to maintain their formation, relieving the Il Focolaren and former McVook Sanguine, who were still managing to hold the southern barrier. To clarify further, Arthur Sui, the Deviant, who is from the future, and whose soul is the archangel that guards guides and links the idea of one history, when in his Captain Hotchell alter ego at least, can fly much, much faster when just using his actual soul activation. Putting it simply, Arthur is a pure shapeshifter, meaning he has little to zero limits. He is a being with no defined shape or form. By the cusp of change that brought the debut of the seventh sanguine week, Y-171, the eleventh demon corpse had fallen to the ground. The ensuing quakes were not the largest source of devastation, not by a long shot. Devastation. O3, O3. The Constant's Majesty, Nan Vav, arrived at Nyashvor's battleship, the midpoint of the River McVox Loop. At this point, there was not a single soul of good on the ship. Nan Vav is a vessel for her Ophidians and their subjects. The free oxygen atoms released through Nan's use of her soul activation are highly unstable, meaning they produce quite the intense heat. Heat so hot, and with a rate of increase that borders on divine. So it cannot be blamed when she takes it upon herself to single-handedly bring flaming destruction to millions of units of currency of Inverison Alliance weaponry, considering their evil occupation. Many of the ultraviolet invaders were of the same race as Parthaneta and the Sedici Contadini, the Razoran. It was a common trend among those who bore the Razoros to refuel their exhausted sleepless selves through a similar yet quite different method than most creatures. Many, if not each and every single Razoran who served Partha Neta, was what you would call a cannibal. They eat other people. It's how they live. Nan Vav destroying every visible speck of inertia her soul could perceive robbed them of that potential. A wise choice. Partha Neta specialized in rapid, bombastic, hit-and-run type warfare. She'd determine the position of her greatest kill opportunity, burn out her energy by killing as many as she could as quickly as possible, then focusing on recovering her breath as her wither ran as fast as it could to bring her to her next moment of opportunity. It was fucking infuriating. Hours and hours went by as the soldiers and commanders of the Alliance, both on their steeds and on foot, continued circling and ensnaring the Ultraviolets and their leader as they used the destroyed remains of the river civilization as cover. If any silver lining was found, it was that very few of the evil Sanguine seemed to view themselves as Partha's soldiers. Well over half the Sanguine that had breached the river were more interested in escaping to Paleo Jersey, 
or the ultraviolet. And with the Holy Prince's forces, the farmers, Arthur and Nan Vav, routing the sanguine east of the river, the last million or so evil sanguine that had called this war theirs hardly even made their way into Kizar's focus, nearly 100 hours since the invaders first arrived. And sanguine Y-171 had been delivered with its brilliant golden sky as the troops west of the river continued to reform and regroup, allowing reserve fighters to take care of the escaping enemies while the higher command continued burning through their energy in their attempts to slaughter Paratha Neta. Nishwar and Nose were the closest to her, but with her steed and the terrain she'd chosen, it was almost starting to look like she'd find a way out of their clutches. Klon and Nan had gotten stuck dealing with the evil sanguine who'd only recently arrived to the battle, thanking their lucky clouds that the Holy Prince had joined their side and added to the shape of their war. Kisar couldn't let her out of his sight. Bartha and Neda's almost rabid, bloodlusting wither made it seem as if the two were a moving storm, both its roars and armored legs stomping through the tattered lands past the river. Bartha had made it more than halfway through the island-like landmass created by the River McVuck's Loop, and though Nishvar was rapidly approaching her, courtesy of his soul activation's effect on his physical limits, he could smell Bartha's excitement in the way her body still moved. The Alliance was here because she'd brought them together, and now she had the chance to prove them all inferior. Despite killing far more in this war than the Lord Holy Commander, it seemed as if she'd just emerged from a week of hibernation. Kisar, his father, and Noes Morel had Parthenita in their sights. It had become clear that her head was theirs. The rest of the Inverison Alliance's high command, save for Andy Vav, who was protecting the ships that lined the river, was kept busy. Now one might assume that the swarm of 2,000,000 enemy invaders would keep most of the Alliance busy, even with the Constance Majesty Nan Vav using her soul activation to set the air itself on fire which in reality simply told most of the enemy invaders where not to go. And while that assumption turns neither you or me into an ass, one would be ignoring the clear point of focus. There was one reason Kisar, Nishvor, and Noahs weren't receiving any help. Ideally, every breathing member of the Inverison Alliance would be helping them murder Paratha Neta, but they couldn't, for one main reason. That reason's name? We'll get to that in a moment. Unseen until unleashed, Klon chanted. Nan was close enough to hear, but she didn't. No one did. Everyone was focusing on the reason, except Klon, his bullet was invisible. Mass that failed to reflect or absorb any visible light flew through the sky west. Less than a kilogram, but moving well over 500 miles per hour, the bullet, a pure not yet sentient beast of Klon's focus, only became visible mere yards away from Partha's wither. Practically immediately before the shadow bullet punctured its hind legs, it was an odd move by Klon, considering how full the hands of his allies over on his front were. Yet his diversion of focus did not go unnoticed by the one particular invading sanguine male who had made it clear to the supreme leader of the fortress of boiled flesh that he and her were destined to be enemies. Nan's kill count was at the top of the board, including all who'd fought in this war, yet every time she used her soul activation to kill him, he rose. Don't you think we could all use a little more clarity? The man asked as he revived once again. Livremka de clarity. The translation is slightly uncertain. What is known, however, is that the phenomena known as soul activation involves at least five states, acting as one. Leave Remk to Clarity continues to rise amidst Nanvav's hellfire. His body's refusal towards the face of certain doom provides an evil ray of hope to every Ophidian still capable of moving their host. Despite the invading force's advantage in numbers, their victory grew dimmer yet dimmer. And now, the endgame starts here. With Kisar ejecting his upper spinal erectors, left serratus, teres minor and major, latissimus dorsi, thoracolumbar fascia, trapezius, all three of his left triceps, and every fiber of paramecium and myosin that made up his left five fingers in the direction of his target. Pour avis, Lord Commander Kisar Shuda of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh's soul activation transfers liquids between containers. Lord Commander Kisar Shuda's left hand contains roughly 450 milliliters of sanguine blood. Or rather, it contained 450 milliliters of blood prior to this soul activation. As he chanted the name, he granted his move. He clenched his teeth, his left arm spasmed in pain, and his soul instantly teleported all of the blood in his left hand into Parthaneta's eyeballs. For readers who aren't quite sure, or at least not super precise on the matter, Parthaneta's eyeballs in total were a mere 15 milliliters. To clarify, Kisar Shuda now only has one hand. Parthaneta now has zero working eyes, their blood dribbles down. The two are in too much pain to speak, their mouths both open as the distance between the two titans of the battlefield closes. The warriors smile and laugh. One of them will die soon. That much is more than clear. Partha's wither threw her off its back after getting shot by Klon's focal beast. It continued to run amok in its confusion, with no direction, attempting to remove the pain that inhibited its movement. Let's go! Niishvor shouted as he activated his basic, physically amplifying, selfish soul, sprinting towards the Paratha Neda barehanded, drawing her perception toward him. Nose and Kizar both carried swords. Nose's sword was larger and two-handed. Kizar's was one-handed, naturally. Paratha Neda brought her axe down, fracturing the moist ground beneath her. Had her hunters been human, the ensuing tremors would have certainly knocked them off their feet. 
Her hunters are not human. Nishvor, on foot, closes in. Kisar and Noah's both push their acceleraptors towards Partha. Kisar's mount is bred for war. Noah's is bred for farm work. She knows that no enemies are in her axe's range yet, but fuck it. Partha Neda activates her soul anyway. I'm gonna fucking kill you. It seemed tighter than it was. The air is stained with esophageal blood. Andy was taking care of any nearby invaders with poorly aimed cannon fire. However, he could sense Nishvor's soul claiming this duel for his house. Kisar felt it as well. Without her sight, Partha had no room to play. Every move would be made to kill. Nishvor enters her range at the downswing of her axe. His right left, raised for a proto-axe kick, created a gust of wind she could easily perceive. The Lord Holy Commander's kicks, with the added strength of his soul activation, had killed dozens over the course of his life. Yet when his heel collided with the blinded Partha's skull, she merely twitched. Now having the position of one of her enemies, Partha directs her murderous intent. Faking a swing of her axe, Partha Netta throws a front kick with her right. Nishvor easily dodges the blind genocider's attack as Kisar and Noas arrive on their steeds. Their smells overwhelm the senses of the stench swarmed ultraviolet. Jumping to match Kisar on his acceleraptor, recognizing his odor the best, Paratha once again faints with her weapon and launches a simple right hook, loosening several teeth of the helmet wearing Nishvor Shuda. With her right hand, she swings her axe, unable to draw any blood but managing to parry the incoming assault from Noah's flaming sword. Nishvor is less lucky. Without any weapons to maintain an outfight, he withstands Partha's convulsing left fist. The idea of war had yet to truly raise the idea of martiality on this planet. Yet her barrage would have won titles across our globe. Kisar dives down. Unlike Kisar, his acceleraptor lacks the fight IQ to determine Partha Neda's decision tree. She grabs Kisar's mount by the throat. But before she can direct the momentum into a throw, Noez slashes and commands his acceleraptor to hard lunge right, escaping her follow-up strike. Nishvor has already caught his breath. His soul activation is basic. Had he been low-born? He might never have considered anything more than his body's need to fight. Nose activates his soul. His sword glows bright orange, burning spots into the vision of everyone who could see. Partha no longer can. She feels the heat before the sword comes down. Too shallow? It would leave a scar on her cheek. But at this point, there was too much pumping through her body for her to even notice. Partha Neda jumps back. As Kisar's acceleraptor's knees buckle under its exhaustion, Nose moves in to protect his vulnerable ally. Nishvor makes the most noise, his drunken slurs taunting the blinded Partha into desiring his death above all else. Her weapon, something akin to sentient, guides her sightless stride. Despite not having the eyes to have seen, Partha Neda somehow perfectly mimics Nishvor's proto-axe kick, charging it up by raising her right foot high, then jumping into Kisar's range with her left while forcing Nishvor to dodge back with her axe. She activates her soul. Her hunters have seen her fight enough to predict its arrival. The only blood that falls is from wounds already open. Recognizing the feeling of her axe cutting nothing but air, Bartha freezes for a mere moment in pure rage. Some believe that severe aggression can be smelled through the excretion of ammonia in the body. Partha drops her axe. The thing is made out of wood and primitive metal. It weighs less than 20 pounds, but it is enough. One straight punch, using her right fist. Partha hits Kisar and he goes flying off his steed. Had Nose not been in the way to catch him? Well, no one can say. Nose catches him, breaking several of the fingers in his right hand. His left isn't nearly dexterous enough to wield his sword by itself but he finds a way to manage. Partha Neda snarls. She activates her soul again, angering herself at her inability to hit anything using the smells and sounds created by her enemies and still rampaging, raging, injured wither to determine the state of the board. Kisar flings around the hand he destroyed, sending S.E. the quickest strike he's ever managed lands, and like a kung fu master, he retracts even faster, lodging most of his right hand in Partha Neda's now bleeding stomach. The pain takes a few seconds. Her head crashes down, then she pulls it back and brings it down once more to lower her weight. Feeling the spurting blood and brains leaking out of Nishvor's cracked skull, Partha Netta shifts her weight to her left foot and hits Kisar in the face with a diagonal hook kick, knocking him on his ass, though he, barely, managed to slice into her calf with his blade. Nishvor was dead. Partha Netta knew the smell of exposed brain, and Kisar's wail of rage proved what she'd assumed. Yet, as her focus shifted to her remaining enemies, while Nishvor's hand was still forced into her abdomen, Partha Netta was absolutely fucking certain that she heard the dead Nishvor's ophidian of creation say that, some girls like it forced, right before his corpse plunged its left hand into Partha Neda's right rectus femoris and twisted. The demon using Partha Neda's axe swings down and to the right, turning Nishvar's body into a mess of fractured bones and blood. Before she can consider the decision of whether or not to remove the Lord Holy Commander's severed hand from her stomach, the demon that's the idea of a standing army forces her grip to tense. She kicks upwards with her bleeding leg, using the pain and numbness to fuel her inertia, separating the arm lodged in her gut from the rest of his corpse. Nose dodges the bits of his body flying his way. Kisar stands almost still. Nose takes advantage of the drop in velocity and tension at the end of Partha's attack, 
thrusting his blade at long range, not actually connecting, but still burning her fingers. As Kisar moves in, Paratha hits him squaw in the jaw with an uppercut. His focus is on her. Till death forced them apart, Kisar accurately predicts her counter of Noah's follow-up and slices horizontally, tearing off most of Paratha's right arm with a set of sounds that would make a normie puke. Paratha takes another hit Kisar assumed she'd dodge, parrying his sword with her axe and getting blown the fuck out toward her rampaging wither. Her Rixoros itches. Paratha falls near her screaming beast. The smell of his wounds and the sounds of his pain are familiar to her. More familiar than any other sensation she'd ever known. As Paratha stood and faced her friend, she remembered being a young girl in the southeast of the ultraviolet seas. Pirate lords were far more common then, and even as a youth, Baratha felt that those who could not survive her did not deserve to. She remembered the first time she feared her own death, as her and her hours-old wither lay in hiding from other evil sanguine whose territory she'd been plundering. They came after me first, Paratha remembered thinking. It ain't fair. Her wither was young at the time, smaller than she was. With how loud it snarled, they'd find her in no time. The young Baratha used every ounce of strength she had to hold its mouth shut and looked it in the eyes. Just wait. If we survive today, we'll win tomorrow. I promise, I promise, I promise you, believe me. She remembered saying to the animal so long ago. Of course, after recovering in the days that followed, Paratha and her young wither murdered every single sanguine who came after her, as well as any who dare treat her lands as their territory. The bloodlust never subsided, and here they were, at the end of that long trail of blood, having torn through multiple continents, spreading fear and terror to those who'd yet to know any better. Back in the present, as Paratha got back up, she looked her only true friend in the eyes and remembered why she'd tamed a wither in the first place. In English, she said, good be with you, my love, and swung her axe down, crushing her wither's spine. Her eyes had lost the ability to produce visible tears, and Paratha impaled her dead wither with what was left of her right arm while carving out bits of Nishvor's left fingers from the wound in her leg. Wither blood contains a coagulating agent that would stop the bleeding and prevent infection. Her ally served its purpose. Her right leg could barely support her weight. She trudged towards the man who sent her here. She uses her bloody axe as a pseudo-crutch, pouncing at her prey. As she swings for Kisar, Nose takes his longer sword and sweeps down, leaving a shallow cut on her back. Faratha takes the fury from the stinging sensation of being slashed and manages a flying left hook on Noe's acceleraptor, killing it like it were never even alive. She activates her soul. Kisar parries with his sword, putting everything into the strength of his grip, but as the sweat and blood drips down his body, he can recognize his strength leaving him. She nearly takes his head off with a lateral slash. He moves back and Noe's activates his soul. Paratha dodges the heat, sending the blood from her wounds into Noe's focus. She jumps to increase the weight of her next attack, and Kisar refuses to give up the opportunity. He activates his soul, sending as much of the moisture from the ground beneath them as he can into her injured leg, preventing her from landing safely. She activates her soul again, tapping into the seemingly never-ending well of stamina her demon was granting her. She nearly falls on her back as she lands, hitting Noah's blade with her own, almost knocking it out of the exhausted slave-owning farmer's damaged and throbbing hands. Kisar slices upwards, grazing the bottom of her chin. Partha swings her axe down, crashing into the wet red sanguine. She throws the axe and her demon at Noe's, and hits Kisar in the face with a short uppercut as her razoros throbs, echoing her pulse through her skull. She hits him with two more strikes, he dodges the third, and she nearly goes to re-equip her blade. But Parthaneta is blind. She realizes she'll never hold her axe again. She remembers the face Kisar made when he ejaculated inside her, and her clit twitches. She lunges and throws a left straight. She hits nothing. Nose attempts to cut her throat from behind, but she ducks. Kaisar attempts to grab her and throw her to the ground, but she dodges. She sets up a combo towards the two who are both well within her range, activating her soul. But in truth, at this point, with Baratha Neda's perception, she and her Ophidians can see what is about to happen. Her body is still programmed to kill until nothing is left to kill. Kaisar thrusts and pierces Partha's heart with his sword, then slices it out through her upper body, flaying off less than half of her left arm, exposing her splintered humerus. Arasasam ota! Kizar screeched, clenching every bit of himself he could. Kisar nearly falls back, having to catch his exhausted body multiple times. Noah's moves in and cuts off the top half of Paratha's head as it falls, then swings in the opposite direction to remove her neck from her torso while using his soul activation. The tip of his sword falls to the ground and his left hand releases the heavy blade, cramped and blistered. His throat and mouth made some noises. The lands west of the river were still being swarmed by invaders, yet Kisar and Noah stood completely still, focusing on their own breath and the lack of the same in their enemy. She was dead. Clearly. Like Nishfer, however, the life that called itself Paratha Neda seemingly had just enough will, perhaps aided by the demon. That's the idea of a standing army. The demon that's the idea of Lagus. Or the very demon that's the idea of a sanguine, to fling its shattered left humerus upwards, deeply cutting into Noah's face as he was examining her fallen flesh. A wave of despairing fear flashed. For less than a second. The surrounding sanguine that could see saw. Her lessers, followers, and enemies had no place here. One second became two, and two became more than a few. 
Anne Inveris and Ophidian told Kizar, Awarida. And as he looked ahead at the falling bodies in the sky ahead of him, at the dozens of titanic-class demons disrupting winds and waves as their defeated bodies fell to the inverse continent's bloodied ground at a rough rate of 4.44 meters per second squared after losing to Hotchel, the deviant's shape-shifting blade, and as the headless, unarmed, profusely bleeding yet somehow beautifully perfect body of the dead enemy commander remained unmoving moment after moment, Kisar inhaled. As hard as he could, immediately after Kisar howled, That's it! She's dead! while pointing his sword in the direction of the fortress of boiled flesh. There was more crying than cheering. There were still over a million who understood how limited their options were and always had been. We are going back home, Kizar commanded as he and his ilk abandoned the battleground at the River McVook and left their defeated enemy's corpse on the ground to rot. They had a fortress to defend. Sanguine Y1.72, the inverse continent. Bharatha Neta is slain in battle. In the days that followed, after the members of the Inverisan Alliance regrouped at the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, resting and adding to their numbers, the standing soldiers who'd yet to fight at all, Destruction and warfare was hastily guided and isolated to the stretch of water still known to the Sanguine as the River McVook. As the last of the escaping ultraviolets made their way back to Paleo Jersey or Sea, the survivors of the river and Il Focolare retook to build their pillaged lands. Wykite and her husband, Noes Moral, kept their family west of the river, not daring to go as far as to claim the River McVook for Il Focolare, but nonetheless worrying all the war torn forces of the future, stresses and strains their nation would soon see. Declarity escaped into the inversion jungle and was never seen again officially. The Sedici, now technically only Undici Contadini, as rulers of the new Il Focolare, now simply being called the Hearth, along with the rulers of the Fortress and the Holy Prince, had formed a compact to establish common law along their borders, creating the western, eastern, and northern borders of the nation of Inverise, while the chaotic cacophony of flora and fauna that was the inversion jungle became the nation's southern border. Many of the soldiers who'd fallen in the war had their bodies stolen to sell to corpse collectors in the ultraviolet sea, or worse, eaten by Barthaneta's Rezoran cannibals. All said and done, the final death count during the war that gave birth to Inverice numbered over 50,000. When Kisar Shuda, Lord Commander-in-Chief of the Fortress of Boiled Flesh's Intelligence, provided the report, he was happy to inform that of the soldiers who fought for the Fortress of Boiled Flesh, the number of the dead, the number of graves they'd have to dig, and names they'd announce at the funeral, was 826. If it is not clear... Inverice is but one nation on this planet called Sanguine by its inhabitants. Like Inverice, many nations are built on the corpses and echoes of fallen nobodies, whose names and abilities lived not nearly long enough to be engraved into the history of their betters. Unlike these other nations, however, that will soon sprout all across this planet's surface, with or without the help of the Constant, the Deviant, or the Quetzalcoatl, it is this nation, called Inverice, that will much sooner rather than later engage and uphold atrocities of horror that will remain unmatched, incomparable, and unheard of across history and across the galaxy. It felling action's weird though, isn't it? I mean, they were already called that way before they were nuked. Sanguine was the Singer, the fifth day of the seventh sanguine week. Now, what may still be confusing here is that despite being the fifth day of the seventh week, Y1.75 indicates 65-day cycles since Ashoka created his calendar with the farmers of the inverse continent. If Y1.11 is the first day of the first week, and Y1.10 is the tenth and final day of the first week, then Y1.00 becomes the hundredth day of the year. I was toying 83 becomes the third day of the eighth week, day 73. Confusing? Hopefully not. Y1.7 sinks. It's been a while. SID changed his name. He's now Sidard. It sounded the same, so don't worry too much. Most sanguine call him the constant anyway. A reminder, Sidard Ashoka Sierra is the main character of this epic. The one in the epic of one refers to him, the demon that's the idea of one. Paleo Jerseyans end conversations with the word word a lot, thought Sidard Siddharth. He was walking north. His followers, who he had to frequently remind were not his followers, were too noisy to ignore. In the time since he left the farm, Ash figured out that his powers work better on people he likes, which is so obvious he almost hates it. It reminds him of Emily Sui, archaic angel of eternity, granddaughter of Kang Silva. And naturally, after everything he's been through, the one he likes the most is himself. Pausing and rewinding, one might ponder why Ashoka had left the farm he'd grown to call home. The Sedici Contadini murdered him in his sleep during the first night of the calendar. Why? To answer, they left him a letter. They kept his corpse strapped to a hexer sign that was already roaming through Paleo Jersey when Sid resurrected, for the fourth time. His body had been left well-armored and armed, the farmers had certainly made his severance package attractive. The rage provided excellent fuel. He considered murdering the Hexer sign and going back to the farm to murder every last one of them. But the isolation of the Paleo Jersey Stonelands, being alone on a planet that was no longer empty, gave Sid a desire to take in his situation, 
and truly tend to the decision tree that lay before him. Above all else, his need to grow stronger remained. He started calling it the Kumar style, but he didn't like the people he was around, so he changed it to the Sierra style. He's a shapeshifter. His soul activation gives him the ability to change, and he truly believes that the Sierra style, his current way of being, is the ultimate primal force. The ideas of the numbers moved far too massively to be measured, even by the king. But the deviant is on planet Sanguine, and seeds reluctantly following at a safe distance, followers seem to know, that the from the future time-traveling shapeshifter's real name is Arthur Suey. It was practically common knowledge which concerned the voices in Sid's head that his sanguine followers called his Ophidians. Sid doesn't like thinking about it. It's kind of hard to tell what's what on this planet, but Sid knows that he likes the vibe he gets from the Deviant, which for now is enough to keep him interested in the future. It's pronounced Sid, by the ways. The demon that was the idea of a first priority had manifested a body during one of Sid's adventures with the farmers. The same mission where he'd won the ring on his right and only thumb, and was now far, far north. Sidarth could tell that much. He'd forgone actively monitoring the demon's status, as if he could at all, while making the internal concession that anything the demon could want or do was well within his expectation. The demon king's subjects gave him little reason to worry. The sanguine, however, their desires and trajectories terrified Sidarth Ashoka Sierra, the constant so much that he found it difficult to allow himself sleep. The sanguine moved quickly and not one of them required a second of slumber. The day was Sanguine Y175. He rubbed the ring on his thumb with his index finger. It was a smooth metal. The Nihord that followed Ashoka everywhere he went was a perfect emblem of his worries regarding the Sanguine. Time, daylight, gravity, weather. They were all so random and chaotic on this planet that he had no idea how much time had passed since leaving Earth. According to the calendar being manufactured by his former co-workers down south, which ran on technology that utilized the demon that's the idea of a counted second, it had been over 1,500 hours since Sanguine Y111, which by Sida's estimate meant it was currently sometime in the summer of 2018. His first demon crown, the demonic entity he'd spent a year and a half crafting, had gone mostly silent. As the demon crown that perceived the beginning, it had little purpose here. Siddharth's second crown, currently in the process of manifesting, which he could decipher as the demon crown that reality alluded to, was partially responsible for his northward trajectory. Siddharth inhaled and got a whiff of the calcium in the demon skull he was wearing as a helmet. There were thousands of sanguine adults and children following him on his journey, yet he knew few of their names. Even the closest among them kept a distance of several hundred feet, wisely heeding the Demon King's constant verbal declarations of dangerous designs. Sid and the Deviant had both built reputations. Most sanguine weren't warriors. Traveling in packs made it easy to gather food and repel demons. They were about halfway between the inverse continent and the collection of territories known as the Urine Babel, which Sid knew little about at this point aside from the fact that religious groups owned land and enforced policy that unified documents, law, and militarized education through the English language. All sanguine could speak and understand every language, but few of the sanguine Ashoka had met instinctually kept it to one. A continent where everyone spoke English all the time was too good to pass up. Ash spent almost every second thinking about his home planet. His goal was to return home, but the undeniable growing forces around him and their galaxy mass souls made it hard for him to take his usual no-fucks-given approach. He stood amidst the crux of all history aware that his decisions could spell complete doom for his species. Preparation was mandatory, tact was a necessity, and demonic consideration violently took time. The golden cylinder hanging from his neck bumped against his chest as he moved. Aside from the growing chains surgically attached to his left residual limb, it was the only weapon he still had. Those two, and the ring on his thumb, he still only had his right arm. The daggers left on his person when he'd resurrected after being poisoned by the farmers did not last long. The paleo jersian stone lands were largely uninhabited for a reason, Siddharth's followers needed to follow him. Not titanic in class, but still towering. Demons roamed the lands, searching wherever they could for sustenance to continue living, until they either couldn't or forced themselves into a savage state of constant change where they'd grow strong enough to find proper feed. Demons that have done a lot can do a lot more. The bladeless aurum hilt he'd taken weeks prior was stronger than it should have been. Gold by nature is a soft, malleable material. Every time Siddharth's skin touched the two-inch diameter hilt, his soul could perceive the metal in its hypothetical unraveled state, flattened into a wire that stretched indefinitely. But Sid could feel the soul of he who designed it. He could feel what this weapon was needed for. Most of all, to Ashoka's dismay, he could feel how much stronger the blade's original wielder was. Based on the architecture of the trial where he'd earned it, he was certain that it belonged to him. God of the underworld, strongly linked to Dios Pitar and the father of all waters, Pluto. The god whose name humanity gave to their final planet. The bladeless hilt continued scratching his chest as he rode north, and Seed remembered the day he stole it. Some days the wind makes you fall in love with life. The speed, its curves, temperature, and humidity. Such extravagant stories trapped by our perception of the air's velocity. 
Siddharth Ashoka Kumar smelled the sanguine air and could feel microscopic angels guarding and guiding the feeling of turning up the volume. You are not a farmer, but nice try. We see what you were going for. His feet felt cold. He continued thinking about their letter. It didn't work out. We killed you in your sleep. Don't come back. Others need you. And if that doesn't seem horrible enough, they ended it by tossing on a less than brotherly version of, we really deserve to not have to deal with you, which is a thing people have the ability to spell. The letter repeated itself three times, once in Italian, once in German, and once in an eldritch, olden form of English. It was carved onto pink stone. Sid destroyed the thing in a fit of rage a few seconds after realizing what they had done, realizing what Arthur, the deviant. He could probably hear us through the fridge anyway. Sometimes people will try to hide things from you that you already know. I'll get it right next time. A double-digit base, ten number, flashed into his head. I promise, I'll do it right. Slave owners. God already damned it, all right? That's one continent down, Siddharth, who hadn't changed his name from Siddharth Ashoka Kumar yet, thought to himself, as he decided not to murder the Hexersign who'd been complacent in their partnered exile. It took a while. He wanted to kill something. Siddharth was too angry to think straight. He then looked around, as he once again allowed the severity of his current situation to set in. The only thing he could recognize around him was the distant cone of Dios Pitar, which was now under the Deviant's control, assuming nothing had changed since he'd last been there. It felt like radiation. Getting this far, he looked over. Realizing there was no proper avenue for him to direct his frustration and anger, Siddharth traveled in the one direction he knew would grant him the largest audience. It took him a few sanguine skies to get to the cone. He'd gotten hungry, and he could feel the perceptions of the soldiers of chaos directed stationed around the divine trial chamber. He felt the stone chain growing out of his left shoulder, gifted to him by the first sentient creature he'd met on this planet. He wanted to get rid of it, to destroy it and murder the Sedici Contadini with it, but he needed the weapon. Sid's general area of focus had widened. With the training he'd put his soul through, he now essentially had a premonitory aura, similar to what activated humans would normally channel into demon lords, swarming his surroundings, giving him a level of constant awareness that was beginning to border on divine. Something weird was going on over by the inverse continent. And as one who relied on his instinct, Sid decided to remain in Paleo, Jersey. He'd yet to hear the name Partha Neta. Sid noticed that several of the soldiers had noticed he was approaching and pushed his right hand forward. Siddharth Ashoka Kumar, the demon king whose soul is the idea of one, tested a new type of move. And before they could finish telling him that they'd attack if he approached a step closer, he chanted, Guide my pupil, Osiris. The ring on his thumb slowly started to hum as it did as commanded. Without a body, but with enough vibration to crash waves, Ashoka's ring formed invisible and intangible constructs of the demon that's the idea of inertia, rising from mantle to crust within the perceptions and amygdalas of the soldiers guarding the chamber, filled with divine weapons known as the Cone of Dios Pitar. The moment he began attacking them, the smell of blood would immediately snap the strongest minds out of their pseudo-paralysis, so he simply stood still. Then he crouched down a little bit, and his entirety, his everything, became his lower half. Sid continued to push back against everything. All of the darkness, the giganutans of demonic collisions within the core of the Demon King's being, continued sharpening and condensing, until Ash could hear a pitch so bright it was ultraviolet. He felt his two legs nearly tear apart as his body released so much sweat, it was as if his every pore was pissing. One instant he was in front of the soldiers, and the next, with a bang and cloud of rising smoke, his body was gone. Those among them with mighty enough kinetic vision knew to look up. The Demon King swung his left side as his body pushed against the chaotic air of Planet Sanguine, and as he grew closer and closer to the peak of the Sky Father's conic temple, he swung the chain of stone and gem, lassoing it around the tip of the temple. With a thud and a painful grunt, his legs and feet placed him several yards from the top of the cone as he caught his breath and allowed his heart's beat to return to normal tempo. Reach was an improper technique. He'd moved past its simple charge up and release, but Hudson River be damned if it didn't pack a punch. He grabbed the chain with his right hand and with an almost prayer chanted in his mind, 20%. Drive. Using 40% of what should have been his body's unrestricted full power was enough to send most of his joints convulsing and cramping. However, with that experience under his belt, channeling the immense power of only 20% was more than enough to shock those who've come to view any part of this world as anything close to constant. And like the tip of a pencil in a hand unable to manage its own strength, the tip of the cone of Diaos Pitar snapped and fell, bringing down several hundred pounds of falling rubble. Light of the sanguine sky filtered into the very top chamber of the temple, where the most valuable artifact was without a doubt hidden. Many of the sanguine down below were atop winged mounts, but every last one of them was smart enough to leave the king to his madness. Using his shapeshifting to prevent even a microliter of palm sweat from lubricating his grip, he single-handedly, D, climbed to the temple's opening and gazed down below. So that's what all that heat is, Ashoka thought to himself, as he came into view of the pouring torrents of lava that made up the temple's ultimate chamber. They flowed into each other in circular patterns, creating a lotus-like shape with a clear center. 
and as if responding to his magnetic gaze. As Ashoka jumped into the sweltering chamber, lava in the very center began bubbling in a way most unnatural. Demons, show me that good shit, the king boomed. The guardian's title began beaming itself into his demonic awareness, filtering through the sieve that was Sid's perception. The voices in his head continued talking over and over each other, translating and retranslating, embellishing and simplifying, until what was left was the clear name and purpose of the bipedal, ten-foot-tall lava demon that stood before him. The demon that's the idea of a guarded trident. Unlike every other chamber in this temple, there were no divine weapons to be seen, no treasures available to steal, no prizes to be rewarded. At least that was what Sidharth could see. He was the demon king, and at this point, he was more than familiar with the essence of a demon's core. While not the same as a human or sanguine heart, their chakras served similar purposes. Yet this thing, there was something foreign in its chest, something that to Sid smelled like home. As the guardian demon began sludging its way over, Ashoka began to run in circles, only using 5% drive, hoping to bait out any projectile attacks. To the demon king on planet Sanguine, death was not permanent. It had no right to hold his attention as fiercely as it still did. But as the heat continued pouring into his flesh, and as his pores began leaking more salty sweat into his primitive clothing, all the king could imagine was the sorts of screams he would sound once his skin came into contact with that guardian demon's lava body. But then, as that feeling continued swirling and engulfing the demon king's entire realm of focus, a glistening star somehow emerged from a point so small it seemed zero mass. This was what this temple was built for. The earthling with a soul so powerful it could create all the weapons that the cone held within its chambers, god or not, had come to this planet, over 50,000 light years away from the planet Earth, to keep this thing hidden from those who'd bleed and burn for power. And now Siddharth Ashoka Kumar is here to take it. He slowed down. The demon wasn't attacking, which made sense. Its body was made of the same flowing lava that circled the chamber's floor. It did not need to attack. Its purpose was to guard the weapon inside its molten body. The subservience gave Ashoka an idea, and the heat gave him another. As he moved, the numerous weapons held together on his person clanked and jangled against each other, and the ring on his thumb buzzed as if some sort of tool designed to measure the guardian demon's intensity. Siddharth and his opponent were surrounded by the rubble created by Siddharth's entrance. He fell into 15% drive to increase his speed. Some fragments were as small as pebbles, but most were larger than Ash's head. The moment his body grew close enough to grab one of the larger fallen conic bricks, he pointed his right side towards the guardian demon, who had remained in place, only moving its body and face to follow Ashoka's position. For a second, it seemed as if the guardian knew what was coming. Seek. It hit. Damage done. The guardian moves from its position. Towards the demon king, Siddharth spins his body clockwise to throw the brick into his enemy's lavic body. Immediately grabbing another one and bounding hard to the left closer to the guardian demon, Sid notes his enemy's attack. The demon that's the idea of a guarded trident pointed one of its arms toward Ash, calling a rising wave of lava from the floor that forces him into 22% drive. Sid chucks another two bricks. He runs faster, taking fewer steps per second, but making further bounds. The demon king, whose soul is the idea of one, focuses his shape-shifting into the five fingers his body still has. Seek required precise manipulation of his soul's fragmentation. This would be a little scuffed. Scatter. Sidharth held down four fingers with his thumb, then activates Seek in all of his fingers to create a scatterburst shot of soul mass. It seemed to work. The demon was angry. Geysers of lava began erupting all across the chamber. Shitfuck 30% drive. The demon king focuses on his breath. Avoiding the bursts of lava takes all his energy. He does not want to give up his chain. Ah! The demon king yells as he sees what he has to do, running towards one of the chamber's walls. 32! He says as he attacks the wall with a boom birthing right Fajin. He falls. Sid stays still for a second to take a break and analyze his surroundings with Snapshot. This was a mistake. While jumping out of the way, most of the information received from Snapshot was overwritten by the pain flooding out of his left leg, which had been burnt through direct lavic contact. 35. Sid screams as the tears of pain prevent him from seeing straight. His left canines dig into his inner cheek to distract himself. Throwing one more fallen temple brick at the demon's body, he surges power through his hand and scrapes the lava off his ass and leg, using the chaotic spasms of agony to launch another scatter. His heart beat heavy. Not enough, he thought. I can lose a few links. The chain growing out of his left shoulder was much longer than his arm. He swung it at the demon. The lava dribbling end of his chain of stone and gem flung wildly as he attempted navigating the pillars of molten rock, swarming his available options. Sid realized it was not random. The demon had been luring him into dead ends after watching his movement style. Sidharth smirked. Admittedly, even within the fear and pain, he was having fun. And he knew what he had to do. Seek. 38% drive. Molten Schlaganf. Seek. Scatter. Constant drive, 35 scatter. And through gasps and hoos and haws, 
Sidharth activated Glisten to get a better grip on a piece of fallen temple too large and heavy for even him to raise, on this planet with gravity lesser than his home. He felt his body push against the limits of 40% of Drive's hypothetical maximum output. If a true 100% had him using his shapeshifting to utilize 100% of his body's latent strength, regardless of the potential drawbacks, then there was still some physical wall in Sid's biology that was preventing him from breaching into higher pools of power. Constant Drive, his concession, was the key to breaking through. As Ashoka grunted and screamed, picking up the piece of wall, he felt the quality of his vision change. As he turned his body counterclockwise, he noticed an almost cyan steam trickling upwards and outwards from his clenched teeth. And the constant, Siddhartha Ashoka Kumar, the demon king whose soul was the demon that's the idea of one itself, yelled, Overdrive. The rubble flew and hit its target. Unfortunately, its target was made of lava, which was why Sid was using Overdrive to close the distance as fast as he could, which was very, very fast. His strides were so wide it looked like a glide. His falling sweat looked like an angelic aura. It doesn't matter how much I lower its temperature. It doesn't matter how viscous it becomes. It's made of lava. It has the density of rock. No matter what, Sid thought as he ran. A festival of bloody steaming shrieks and screams exploded from Siddharth's throat chakra as he sank his only hand into the face of the lava demon, pressure of the demon king. Siddharth felt the voices of his soul chant, in unison. His body realized what happened after his soul, hence his dropped guard. The lava splashed back as the guardian demon's body dissipated almost instantaneously. Siddharth deactivated his techniques and quieted down the voices in his head that helped during combat. He fell to the ground, burning his knees and shins and even his esophagus a little, which is weird because heat rises, but his hand was in such tremendous pain it didn't matter. Stay awake. The golden treasure before him seemed to enjoy his plight. Out of instinctive response, Siddharth grabbed the cylinder that was still hot from the lava it had, up until recently been submerged in. The number of carvings across the surface of the bladeless hilt Siddharth was holding must have been in the millions. They were far too precise to have been created by human hands or tools. This, this is why I'm here, he thought, laughing through excruciation. He raised his chin with his gaze to take in the setting sky above him. With the temple seemingly deactivated with the defeat of its guardian, all the lava was cooling down, set to harden into warm rock. Some of Ashoka's sweat had dried and his skin felt sticky. He took a few minutes to recharge and organize his new techniques. Healing burns with shapeshifting was a whore in the taint. He climbed up and out and holding his hand against the moving wall of the cone, slid down Pluto's personal temple. He noticed two tiny dragonfly-looking critters buzzing around one another in what seemed to be an insectoid mating dance. They were unaware. Sid hated seeing couples in public, but it was one of those moments he just knew he'd remember for as long as he lived. His soul throbbed in longing. He missed his friends. He wanted them to be here with him, but more than all, he wished Emily was with him. I might have to kill some of them to get out of here, Ash thought, despite having killed a total of zero sanguine sentience. The golden hilt vibrated wondrously in his hands, and through those vibrations, Ashoka already felt he knew the blade. The vibration never ended. Always right there if he placed his hand against it, fueling his soul with the negative space of the imprint left by its previous user. Much later, on Sanguine Y1.75, the fifth day of the seventh week of the first year, which was the 65th day of the year, not the 75th, the vibrations of the bladeless golden hilt tapped against his chest as the weapon hung from a necklace gifted to him by a paleo jerseyan. Pluto's dagger fell to earth. It reminded Siddharth of humanity. Absorbing its vibrations felt as if it taught him of the life of Pluto Hades Yucatidea. He retained none of the memories, but he could feel what they were. They affected him. He dropped his body, lying down on his stomach atop his northward-walking hexer scene. Its fur was prickly and strong. He thought the Big Bang must have been lonely, which is perhaps why Siddard kept to a quiet mumble. Hey, demon god, the idea of zero, y you know, I don't, really. His eyes gave him a look. Because Sid doesn't believe in zero. The embarrassing thoughts and philosophies would make a lot more sense if you knew what Kazar's actual goals were. Compare those, and yeah, this really is nothing. I can feel it. Just a weed in the plot. Less than a training arc, by Moral thought, as he rode his Acceleraptor south, deep into the jungle country, Inversha. Not to be confused with the nation of Inverise, north of the South Pole, containing the fortress, the cathedral, chaos erected, and the newly rebuilt lands of the hearth containing Shida farms. Inversha, the jungle country, surrounded planet Sanguine South Pole. It was the South Pole of this world that shared a name with its dominant species. After the ultraviolet rampage, extremely few could stand the stench of the jungle, not to mention the harsher climate and demonic population. There were sanguine who'd repopulate the area, but they were nowhere near the strength and numbers of the pre Nita jungle sanguine. Hell of a meeting spot, thought Vena. It reminded him of the constant. Certain types tended to. He had only met one so far, Zikis, but he was looking forward to spending the next week with all of his future business partners. The old founders of Moral Farms were his family. But with Vienga's soul activation, he just had to divide his focus. The Razoron people deserved it. They deserve me, he thought. Zikis could see that. That was why she had set up this meeting. She knew the business Kayul and Verdere were starting needed someone like Vinamoral. 
And so whatever we do here, I mean I should have made more progress with blueprinting, I haven't unfortunately, Zeke's explained, but I thought if we agreed on one, the general narrative of controlling imports and using Riazoros as a fuel source, it shouldn't take long at all. Dot. She knew how to get snowballs started. How much are you trying to raise for seed? Get me an idea, Zeke's asked of Verdeer. We're at 150,000 deviations, aiming for three. Total, Verdeer responded. In Inverize, there were two primary ways of receiving large investments. The primary source involved petitioning the leaders of Inverize with a proposal, requesting a loan from the government itself. The second easiest way to raise funds, while less straightforward, could potentially see much greater returns in shorter time frames. By creating chained and grouped contracts with Paleo Jersey and ultra bullet traders, it was possible to receive enough capital to start a successful business venture without receiving government funding. Verdeer and Kyle were planning on raising deviations through both methods to meet their target. Zeke's continued making sure she had everything straight. So right now you're mostly for dying. What's the time frame for raising money from the aristocrats? Verdeer answered with production should be underway by second year. Do you have a short list of three or four investors you were thinking of targeting? Zeke's asked. We have way more than that, Kyle answered. Vina jumped in, right with the short list. Of course you know who you want, but is there anyone who you really think might bite? That got them. Verdeer and Kyle said their translations of no in unison. Kyle said that part of what we're doing right now is figuring out, honestly, so, I'll give you a little context. Genome therapy is the only place we're seeing aristocrats fighting right now. That's W that's why we're having these conversations, creation damn it, Vina thought. The nobility aren't interested in treating Rhizerans. They want to breed us out of existence. Zeke's mum mumbled to herself before voicing, because even if it's not a gene therapy based look, oncology focused engineering will go after companion data if we've confirmed responders. Right? Um, so that would be one. Keep that in the back of your pocket. An assumption to challenge yourselves with. The other is the diseases themselves. Most of the diseases elderly Rhizerans lose immunity to don't have diagnostic data for one to two days after realization. But they're very quick acting once in effect. So I think the case in point, and this is where my prior blueprinting comes in, we put out a hypothesis out there, and this hypothesis we confirm at first right, your manufacturing potential, for the engines we can create now, and I think that we can easily sell the value of the current iteration, with incremental increases in value over time, compared to what's being built today. So we've got a patient, in your case, the only patients are Rhizerans being killed by the Riazoros, MHM, um, this is the core, Ziki said as she drew a diagram in the massive papers they'd laid out, the three types of sanguine that can use these engines are those with a subdermal Riazoros, a diseased Riazoros, and an irreparably damaged Riazoros. And the current iteration engines can use fluids released by Riazoros as fuel dot. Yes. Your biggest pain, Vina started, is cured with an informed hypothesis, and for a moment we're not even worrying about any intellectual property, just out and out, sale and revenue streams, the leading source of cash is selling production means back to the investors, and the second leading source is going to be this one, and the last one is going to be this, he said as he pointed to the two words he'd written down indicating their other two primary markets. Verde and Kayol vehemently agreed. They were looking forward to the returns on such an inert investment. Higher precision output projections can still omit information that people with diseased Riazoros can benefit from. If we can create an inverse relationship between power output and disease onset, the notion of treatment through fuel collection will grow into a natural landing point, Vina said. Kayol had something she wanted to bring up. It had to do with the Enga's role. We'll have our intent is to have a relationship with our users. And to continue the relationship. Um, if we have a positive indication, I'm just trying to ensure the experience matches what you're saying. If we have a positive indication there's a good chance Rhizerans use us to bridge the care navigation and they shut our costs off and they don't stay with us. There's a good chance unless we say pro bono, Vina had to cut her off well it may be more than that, you may have to actually pay them to stay with you. By the way that's how this whole thing works, the Razoron registry. We can get the aristocrats to pay up. They're already paying for Razoron treatment indirectly as it is. Stemming the disease from the source is beneficial to them. Verdeer gave his idea, we could, have the subscription go away but still provide the navigation support. There should be value in, well we could test that dot. Well I was thinking we could do more tests, Kyle said. Look, at the end of the day, Rhizerans are currently liable for their own condition. If it's their fault at age 120 or a genetic curse at age 10. You have to recreate a relationship and transition someone living with a damaged or damaging Riazoros who hasn't had a problem until they turned 80. We're still getting word from investors that they're worried about mom and dad. We create a solutions for a kid and you know, the kid and their parents are interlinked at this point. So we're already getting our product questioned. There were more economic talkings. Discussing other engineering developments regarding Riazoro's treatment. They discussed payment plans and debt cycles. But after a few hours, talking had mostly died down, as new ideas grew rare and the work they'd done spoke for itself. They were ready to end the meeting, until Vina suggested, what if you bought a bank? From the cathedral? Eventually, however, it was time for Vina to head back home. He had more than enough homework to get started on. In conclusion, Zeke's asked Verde or Hey the company. It's not called Nutrier Healing anymore, right? What's the new name? And in plain, 21st century American English, he answered Nurse Joy with a grin so bright it did blind ya. District 4, Proving Worth 
The Ophidian of creation does not sleep. When he tires, the void consumes him, ruling until he too becomes tired enough to be devoured. Sire was crying. Quite loudly, if it is appropriate to add. He didn't care who was watching. His pseudo-caravan had mostly disbanded. They'd traveled far north enough to where there were now frequent settlements everywhere they went, and roads that could take the Sanjiyun in almost endless directions. Sire Eskol was still the continent to his north, the
District 6, Zhejiang. Division of One. Did you know? Even the most competent observers can be sparked with fear. Meek. Part of this vibe? Staying up this long? The like, the whole point is that I'm the one awake. If no one is sleeping, what's the gain here, she thought. Her home state where she lived had no lack of people staying awake until the sun rose. But here, New York City, you know what they call it. Jaden is sensitive to relativity, especially since her soul activated about half a year ago. If I can't compare myself to every single meteoric soul, Jaden thought to herself among the rowdy chatter of the at-capacity bar and club she'd invited her co-workers to. Their company, Suitable Cleaning, was New Jersey-based, as was she, but plenty of their employees and several of their executive board members were New Yorkers. She felt it all, smooth like a chocolate ballad. The divisions between each and everything, between each and every soul, the path that light took as it became darkness. Jaden could smell the angels at war with the demons in this place. She loved it and took another shot of tequila with the man sitting to her side. As a director, she had the lowest ranking, so to speak, out of all the co-workers she'd invited. Her target was her superior, though not technically her boss. She was here to kill the man sitting next to her. This was why she invited everybody out to somewhere nice and public. He was a member of Suitable Cleaning's board of directors, and though Jaden had yet to acquire a seat at their table, she planned on rising up soon. Unfortunately for Jaden, with the current changes that were happening above the upper levels, suitable cleaning would be restructured so that even after joining the board, she'd be unable to benefit or implement her major projects for a year at least. Chelsea Sui, who was currently living in China, was the inheritor to the company ever since her entire family in New Jersey had tragically died in a house fire. She was still several years away from being old enough to run the company, so several of the late Lawrence Sui and Kang Silva's advisors were in charge of managing the corporation. Jaden did not know how much Chelsea knew regarding her company's true mission statement, and their less than public operations, if anything at all, but plenty high-level employees of suitable cleaning were well aware of what they were up to. The souls of the demons. The demon souls. Ever since the red lightning. That was what she called it. That woman who claimed to work for one. Ever since the red lightning disappeared, demon doping became fair game across the planet. There wasn't anyone putting any restrictions on supernatural conflict. People mysteriously gained mythical abilities out of nowhere and had not one to slow their rend of chaos. After tonight, people would know what she'd done. But the cameras will make it clear that I'm innocent. Jayan looked over at a bathroom sign to deliver into her target her intent. Not to mention all my witnesses, she thought. She touched his hand with hers, and in truth, she could have left then and there. That was enough. I'll be right back, okay? She said as she traced her hand up Iz's arm and placed her palm on his chest, reinforcing her soul's ability and initiating the curse. She got out of her seat as the curse spread, the man too drunk to realize what had begun. Once she was five paces away, the curse took complete effect. And Jaden Zachariah, as the woman whose soul is the royal demon knight that's the idea of two itself, or as she likes to call herself, the demon that divides, turned around to a crowd of panicked yells and a fountain of blood. One half of her target's body fell to the right, the other half fell to the left. She, and of course Sidard, had no way of knowing at this current moment, in the whimpering winter of 2018, but the rings of Saturn were glowing extra beautifully. Also, during that extended moment, while the royal demon knight that's the idea of two enjoyed swimming in the cacophony of horror she'd spawned, on the planet called Sanguine, Ashoka was thinking and going, hmm, I gotta reconsider what I've been focusing on. So Sid shut off his perception. He focused on the idea of black. He used his everything to strengthen that idea as much as he could. And then it changed. Perception sharpened and polished by martial arts, perceived and iterated through interaction. The idea of a main character stood upon the idea of mainness and the idea of character, evolved or rather were plundered by the idea of protagonism. Through the dimension of focus, a battle occurs between the ideas of attraction and translation. Impetus denies taking either. The ideas of the self and the one. Unending peace feel they have been robbed of what seats should have been there. Siddharth had no demon lords in the way that humans and now Sanguine typically formed contracts with the highest caliber demons. Instead, he had the potential to raise demon lords to serve him as their king. However, his reason is lacking. Divide everything by itself, and which one remains? It'll tell you. Everyone represented by fucking me,